Oh, hi everyone. Uh, let me actually open my video if I manage to. One second. Dan, uh, are you playing your recorded video or are you going to do a live talk? It's going to be live. I don't know how to play my recording. Okay. I thought that they will do it, but anyhow. So, okay. so hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can see me and you can see my uh, screen. I can tell you that until uh, 12 minutes ago, I thought that it's going to be a video and I wasn't. Uh, so they'll show the video that we recorded a couple of weeks ago, only then I realized that we're going to do it live. So live it is. So we're going to talk about uh, event-centric natural language understanding. Uh, I'm a first uh, of a group of uh, six speakers. So you'll hear from Wu Chen, Honming Zhang, Chiang Ning, Meng Ling Li, and Heng Ji in the next three hours or so. And we are hoping that you're not going to listen only, but kind of ask us questions. We're definitely going to break between sessions. Uh, to facilitate questions. Uh, okay, so yeah, so so uh, really, when we think about natural language, why do we need natural language? We need it to describe and reason about events. So you can look at the example that I give here in the top right, which is uh, related to an event that happened a couple of weeks ago just two days, I think, before we, we first recorded this. Or you can look at a recap of a football game uh, or many other types of documents. In all cases, we are here really talking about uh, uh, describing event, providing information about them, reasoning about it. We want to know what happened. Uh, we want to know who did what to whom and why. We want to understand what led to what has happened and what might have caused it. And we perhaps want to hypothesize what might happen, um, how would people think about it and how people would feel about it. Um, and when we describe events, we actually describe it at multiple level of uh, abstraction. So you can see here in this example, six different snippets. They all refer to the same event, uh, but they all talk about it in different ways, probably, uh, with the intention of uh, directing it to different audiences or just, just providing different level of details and level of abstractions. So you can look at the events uh, on the left here where that describes a big events, a Napoleon invasion of to Russia. And you can see that an event that took three months is compiled into one slide describing the key components of it and providing also some visual uh, perspective on, on what happened. Um, and again, allows us to reason about it and perhaps think about um, uh, causes and reasons for uh, some of the sub-events. And, and when we think about events, we also think about it with multiple goals in mind. I mean, you can think about just analysis. We wanna understand the history. We wanna understand perhaps uh, synthesize some information from multiple sources. And perhaps we wanna uh, understand events because we want to understand what will happen, or this hypothesis, what what could happen in the future. Um, so far, most of the work in NLP uh, really focuses on understanding what the text says. Uh, we really analyze what's written here, at mostly at the sentence level, uh, but more and more we are moving to analyze things at the document level and even sometimes at multi-document level. Uh, but with the progress at this uh, level of understanding of what the text says, we can actually move to understanding what is happening, more understanding situations um, and, and events. Uh, and again, we want to do it for uh, multiple reasons uh, from what is happening to uh, what may happen uh, later. So when we think about natural language from this uh, angle of uh, events and what is happening, uh, we may change a little bit some of the foci and the priorities. Of course, it requires local text understanding. 
but it also necessitates that we integrate information for multiple documents, multiple modalities. Um, and we think about uh, other aspects. For example, we need to aggregate information quite often and consolidate information. We need to understand different types of events. Some events actually happen. Some of them are just intentions. Some of them are thoughts. We want to understand relations between events. We want to understand time and causality. Uh, quite often, we have to acquire a background knowledge and use common sense knowledge in order to interpret events. Uh, and of course, we need uh, the ability to generalize beyond grounded events, uh, observed events, and observed processes to some more general um, issues. Uh, sometimes we want to do it just to understand what is happening. Sometimes we want to be able to acquire also the ability to predict either implicit events, things that are not being said explicitly in the context of a given story, and potentially even future events uh, that we anticipate will happen given our understanding of what has happened. Um, uh, eventually, I think uh, we would also like to know, uh, to understand multiple perspective of what has happened. So given a query or given a description of an event, we wanna know, uh, what are multiple possible ways to interpret it or to reason about it? Um, and this might also come together with some level of trustworthiness in various interpretations. Um, okay, so uh, one example that I'd like to run through that uh, I think exemplifies a lot of the tasks that eventually you wanna get to, to study when we think about events is, is the compilation of a history book. Uh, this is something that ideally we're going to do at a level of, uh, at multiple level of granularities, accounting for multiple perspectives and interpretations. Uh, and given the times that we are at now, uh, no better topic to think about than the history of democracy. And I'm going to provide a small window into this by thinking about the French Revolution. So what I, I'm going to show here and in the next few slides is one way to view uh, history or a collection of events at multiple level of granularities, and that's via uh, flowcharts, where the nodes in these flowcharts are gonna describe events at different levels of granularities, depending on my current uh, view, and arrows are gonna describe influence between events. So, in this case, when I'm talking about the roots of the French Revolution, uh, you may see things like uh, the male uh, literary literacy rate went up by 50% in the 1780s. And this was a good reason, uh, or at least as a good trigger for uh, the roots of the French Revolution. You can also see uh, things like the spread of enlightenment ideas on liberty and democracy. In this flowchart, there is no mention of the role of the rise of the democracy in America, which some might say actually had a huge role on, uh, on the French Revolution, but it's missing from here. And that's another uh, issue that we wanna look at and study when we think about events, because you can see that multiple interpretations are possible. I can move to look at other perspective. For example, here I'm going to look at the start of the French Revolution and think about various events that could have led, according to this historian, to the beginning of the French Revolution. Um, and you can also think about in more details about the course of the French Revolution, uh, specific details that led in this period of time between 70, 1789 and 1871, um, what has happened then? Uh, all the way up to the results uh, of the French Revolution. And again, you can think about uh, multiple results, liberty and equality, certainly one of the outcomes that for sure in retrospect, we can um, attribute to the French Revolution, but we can also think about nationalism. Uh, as one cause. And again, you can see that when we think about events quite often, uh, 
even though the facts, or in most, in most cases are there, interpretations or labeling uh, might vary. Um, and uh, I show this in, in quite fine granularities, but you can also step back and think about uh, it from a higher level perspective and just think about the age of revolutions and the place of the French Revolution in the bigger picture of a long period with uh, multiple revolutions. So that's one way to think about it as a collection of flowcharts, a different granularities and a collection of relations between events. Uh, but you can also uh, take a temporal perspective here and just try to build a timeline of all the events uh, that happened, say, between 1780 and 1871. Uh, and you can even uh, zoom in and, and kind of look at a, a specific period and the timeline there. Uh, so, so all these are things that today we take a lot of time uh, to do, uh, but the study of events or study of event uh, centric natural language processing could allow us to, to do uh, in a better way to automate um, and uh, perhaps focus on some of the more difficult issues like interpretation, like perspectives and trustworthiness uh, of these kind of things. Um, okay, so, so with this in mind, uh, what are we gonna do in this tutorial? So we wanna present uh, current research uh, on events uh, and we're gonna spend the next two and a half hours or so uh, presenting our perspective on current uh, event. And I'm gonna just give you uh, a quick glance into what we're gonna present. So of course, we're gonna start with the basic components which have to do with event extraction. Given text snippets, we wanna identify events. We wanna identify event arguments. Um, and, and there are multiple methods, uh, multiple machine learning methods uh, to support this. Um, of course, we wanna move beyond single events and we wanna think about uh, relations between events, uh, multiple relations between events from co-reference relation to uh, child-parent relations to temporal relations between events. And overall, we wanna be able to present this kind of schema view of events where multiple events uh, co-occur or occur in a process. And we wanna identify them, we wanna identify relations between them uh, we want to think about all the types of relations, for example, associating with events, their duration, their frequency, perhaps their absolute typical time, uh, and so on. And, and we want to do this not only with, from text, because quite often images or videos even shed a lot of uh, insight uh, to events. So we also going to think about event extraction uh, in the multimodal uh, uh, scene. Uh, a lot of the work that will be presented has to do with relation between events. Uh, in order to think about it, we also think about types of events because you cannot study relations between any uh, two events. Some event, events actually happen, some event were just thought about, some event were intentions, uh, and we wanna be able to incorporate this uh, into our study and of course incorporate into our study background knowledge about it. Um, if we think about time, we have some declarative knowledge that we have about time, like transitivity of time. In other cases, we have other constraints that uh, some statistical and some declarative that allow us uh, to do a better job at understanding relation between events. So we're gonna talk both about the type of knowledge and we're gonna talk a little bit about the type of methods that have been, that have been used in order to uh, study these uh, issues. Now, uh, events, again, are not happening in isolation. And we wanna be able to study processes uh, over basic events. And when you study processes, you can think about um, multiple ways to think about it. You can think about observing uh, or you can think about, I have a goal, I wanna be able to buy a house. 
what are the steps that are required, that I'm required to take in order to do this. Um, or you can think about it uh, bottom up where you observe multiple events and you want to abstract it and you want to understand what is happening here, what are they doing. Um, and of course, we want to think about it in, in the context of language and think about the, the development of narratives that describe events, uh, how to understand it both in a top-down way and in a bottom-up way. Um, Understanding events require that we understand uh, common sense, uh, or at least some aspects of common sense. And we're gonna discuss the contribution of background knowledge and common sense knowledge to our current technologies uh, of understanding events. We'll think both about reasoning about events directly, reasoning about uh, various aspects of uh, relations between events and reasoning about time and causality. Uh, and common sense that we have about this aspect from typical time of events to typical temporal relations uh, to typical durations and frequency of events. Uh, so uh, overall, this is the plan of the tutorial. After this introduction, uh, we're gonna continue with event-centric information extraction and move on to think about event-centric uh, relations between events. Uh, then the plan was to have a short break, even though I think we've been notified that there's not going to be a break. So we'll directly continue with thinking about a uh, work on processes, uh, followed by um, work on common sense in the context of events, and then end with uh, 20 minutes of thinking about conclusion and some future work. Uh, so with that, uh, I can open it up for a couple of minutes of questions before we move on. Okay, so I have allowed to unmute uh, all the audience to unmute themselves. So feel free to ask questions if you have any. Or perhaps we can continue to move on to the technical sections where people will have more questions. Yeah, sure. You can you can go ahead. We're just yes. on time. So let's move on to Mani and Han for the event centric information extraction part one. Mani, you're muted. Yes, sorry, I was muted. So uh, this is Manling from AIOC. I'm currently a PhD student working with Professor Hong Ji. And uh, thanks for listening to our tutorial. I'm presenting the first technical part about information extraction in event-centric natural language processing. So the definition of events is broad. Uh, for example, events can be momentary, like sneeze here. And it can also indicate something that happens, like running. Uh, in natural language processing, we focus on specific events that triggers a change of status. I will introduce event extraction following four parts. Uh, firstly, when we have training resources, we can learn to extract events in a supervised setting. And then we can extend the extraction model to new domains, new languages, and new data modalities. Uh, so information extraction aims to extract the structured knowledge from the unstructured data. And the event, uh, each event contains a trigger word and uh, several arguments. Uh, for example, uh, here the fire triggers the attack event, and its instrument is this tank, and um, uh, its target is Palestine Hotel. So it's a structure prediction task. And uh, uh, to extract this kind of structure, uh, the unstructured data can be in any domains, any languages, and any data modalities. And in old days, what we normally do is spending like a few of the, a few days to carefully design symbolic features for different tasks. 
and each task will need their task specific subset of features, tools, and resources. Uh, the good thing of this uh, feature engineering is that it's explainable and we can see which feature help which task. However, this process is time consuming and we need to redo the entire process if we have a new task. To reduce human effort, modern methods throw away symbolic features and use embeddings instead. Uh, for example, this uh, work use LSTM and CNN to encode the context. And in this work, the symbolic features are added as additional features by concatenating with word embeddings. For example, this entity embedding, uh, entity type and the dependency tree relations are all symbolic features used. However, uh, this framework uh, only take uh, existing entities as input, so it cannot handle the errors propagated from entity and the relation extraction. And also it ignores the interdependencies between these uh, entities and the uh, events. So um, in this example, uh, the election event should always have only person argument. And in the meanwhile, this person argument is not the same person of the resigning event. So this kind of uh, interactions between the knowledge elements uh, can be help, uh, can be used to help uh, event extraction. And our recent work, YIE, is an end-to-end -end neural model to jointly extract uh, entities, relations, and events. So it outputs an uh, information network instead of separate knowledge elements. This model firstly uh, encodes the tokens in the to uh, input sentence and then decode a graph directly. In this graph, each node can be uh, either an entity or an event, and the edges will be relations or event argument rows that connect these entities and events. It does not rely on simple symbolic features uh, like dependency passing, so it's capable of extracting events from multiple languages using multilingual BERT. Um, this model tried to use symbolic features to incorporate high-level global knowledge. Uh, for example, when we do event detection, it's really important to understand what happened in the past uh, because history always repeats itself and uh, maybe from millions of historical events, we can learn that uh, uh, some global patterns will happen and uh, we can use this global pattern to uh, to, uh, to help event extraction. We call these global patterns as the event schema. Uh, this is an example of a uh, civil unrest event schema. It models interactions between these knowledge elements. For example, after uh, public speaking, there will be social gathering event, and the audience uh, of the public speaking is the people that uh, is gathering. To induce this kind of event schema, we use templates to explore the interactions between knowledge elements. Uh, for each template, we fill in all possible types to generate a set of global features. For example, here, uh, the first feature means that an entity is a victim of a die event and also a target of an attack event at the same time. Uh, the second one is similar, uh, but uh, the person entity is the attacker, which is usually not true in the training set, uh, except that there's a suicide, a suicide case. In this way, the model learns to uh, promote the first uh, template because uh, it's always happen and it's a positive feature. And the second one is the negative feature. And uh, uh, our model will learn to uh, uh, you uh, use these features to promote the information graphs that containing the first structure and demote the graphs matching the second fe feature. So this schema library uh, can also be further extended. Our work on schema induction using path language model to extend these templates to automatically discover longer even paths. Mm, with these uh, schema features, we uh, we not only use the type prediction score, but also trying to add a global feature score. So it learns the weight of each feature automatically and add the weighted score into the type prediction score. Uh, and here we call the type prediction score as local score since it only relies on the prediction of types. And for uh, the global features score, we added into the, uh, we added it into the local score and we use this combined score to do beam search to generate the graph. Uh, in this decoding step, it generates 
it, one node and predict the edges between this node and the existing nodes. So uh, in the node step, it predicts top K node types for the new node. And in the edge step, it predicts top K edge combinations with existing nodes. Then all the candidate graphs are ranked based on the combination of local scores and global scores. Uh, the local score helps to select the best type and the, the global score pro, uh, promotes the graph that matches the event schema. For example, here are two candidate subgraphs. The first one may have a higher local score, um, but uh, it predicts an organization as an entity of a fun event. This is not true in most cases. And uh, this model can demote this candidate with global features. Uh, so uh, the model can know that compare is a person instead of facility since uh, it's the entity of finement. This model outperforms the state-of-the-art end-to-end IE model on most subtasks on ACE 2005. Uh, the experiment results show that uh, this model can easily uh, be adapted to other languages such as Chinese and Spanish. And the, the model feature is independent of language, so we can actually add the English training data to further improve the performance of Chinese and Spanish model. And all this work are sentence level IE. It ignores the arguments from other sentences. So recently there are work uh, extending this sentence level IE to document level IE. The basic idea is to link the argument rows to text mentions in the entire documents. And the, the linking is based on the contextualized embeddings. To get the embedding uh, representing argument rows, uh, the trigger embedding and the row embedding are combined. And this combined embedding is uh, further linked to the text arguments by comparing the text argument representation using a linking score function. Uh, and the, uh, considering that the searching space of arguments is huge, when the document is long. So a pro function is learned to select top K candidate arguments for each trigger. Also, there are some new paradigms proposed for IE tasks. Uh, for example, to avoid the error propagation from entity extraction, question answering based event extraction is proposed. And uh, in this work, several uh, question templates are predefined for each event type. And for each input sentence, uh, we map it uh, into the standard BERT in input format using these que question templates. The extraction is done by two BERT-based QA models. Uh, the first one is for event trigger detection, and the second one is for argument extraction. Uh, in this way, the trigger detection becomes a request to identify the action of the verb in the input sentence and also determine its event type. And the argument extraction becomes a sequence of requests to identify the text spans as arguments. And the extraction process can be regarded as the process to generate answers uh, for machine reading comprehension. Um, okay, now we have uh, with the success of supervised model for one domain. How can we transfer this knowledge to extract the events in a new domain, uh, which has completely new event types? If we perform AMR parsing to the input sentence, we can see that a trigger and its event type label usually have some shared meaning and their structures can uh, be similar. As a result, we model uh, event extraction as a generic grounding problem by mapping each mention to its semantically closest event type. For example, the trigger fire can be grounded to attack and the dispatching here can be grounded to transport person. Um, given a target event ontology, the goal is to learn generic mapping function that map uh, that and this mapping should be depend independent of event types. So it can be trained from annotations for a limited number of scene types and uh, then applied to any new unseen event types. So we jointly represent and map event mentions and types into a shared semantic space. And for event mentions with unseen types, their structures uh, will be able to project into the same semantic space using the same framework. And then we can assign types with top ranked similar uh, values. To construct a common space, uh, we minimize the distance between each event mention and its corresponding type. For example, the representation of fire is optimized to be close to the representation of event type attack. 
And uh, this knowledge can be transferred from existing types to the extraction of unseen types by projecting the unseen types to the shared common space using the same mapping function. As a result, without any annotation, annotations, this transfer learning approach achieved the performance comparable to the LSTM trained on 3,000 sentences with 500 annotated even mentions. It shows the success of this transfer learning pro uh, framework for new event types. To summarize, for any new unseen event types, this model only needs an ontology definition of the unseen event types, like its type name and uh, its role names and also needs some annotations for one or few seen event types. However, event type is not the only informative part of event definition. There are also definition sentences and also a set of argument rows and the entity type constraints for each row. To fully represent this semantics of row, uh, labels, uh, instead of using single words or single embedding, the labels are represented as a cluster of contextualized embeddings. For example, each node here uh, is a contextualized repetition of a label, uh, say a tag label. And uh, by analyzing the distribution of these repetitions, we can easily get the cluster of its even type, uh, which is a green circle here. So if a new trigger comes in, and if its representation appears inside the circle, uh, say the blue node, then we assume that it belongs to this type. Otherwise, like uh, this red one, we assume it's not uh, this even type. So after this initial prediction, we can then leverage the entity type constraints, like this constraints, and model the final prediction as LP problem. So here is the details about the overall proposed framework. It consists of two parts, the, on, the online preparation and uh, the offline preparation and the online prediction. In the offline preparation phase, uh, for each predefined event trigger or argument type, we firstly find some anchor words, basically the labels themselves as well as the synonyms. After that, we find several contextualized usage of these words in the external corpus, like New York Times corpus. And um, we call these sentences as the anchor sentences. For each of these sentences, we can get a contextualized vector for the anchor words. And then based on all of these vectors, we can get the even type representation in the embedding space. During the online prediction phase, given an event, we first acquire its contextualized representation for all trigger and argument words following the same way we did for labels. After that, uh, we find their position in the embedding space and make the prediction accordingly. On top of this initial prediction, we involve the constraints from event definition to regularize the final prediction. We use two different representation methods for triggers and arguments. When we generate embeddings for triggers and trigger labels, we do not have any masking operation. So basically we input the entire sentence and then select the representation at the corresponding positions. However, for arguments, we use mask uh, to mask the target argument and only use the context to generate the representation. Our motivation is that uh, most of the triggers contribute the most uh, important semantic meaning. And uh, uh, on the contrary, the semantic arguments are often inferred from their context rather than from the arguments themselves. For example, man many arguments are pronouns or names. Uh, so they only have a weak semantics by themselves and uh, we need to understand them by understanding their context. So here is a, a experiment result. We did the experiment on 2005 to compare with uh, previous work. We showed the performance on two settings. Uh, in the first setting, we only evaluate on the least 23 frequent event types. And the results show that the system actually performed very well. And in the second setting, uh, we performed the evaluation on the entire data set. And this model can correctly map uh, around the 80% of the triggers and 50% uh, of the arguments to the correct type. Uh, this result is actually very encouraging and uh, it shows that it's possible to only leverage the semantic of the labels to make the prediction of events. 
Experiments also show that uh, like 10 example sentences already allows us to achieve this performance. Uh, one explanation is that the event labels are carefully selected by experts. So the semantic of a predefined event type uh, should be the same as the most popular meaning of the label word. As a result, even though the label words may have multiple semantics, we can always get the most popular meaning uh, by the average of the few of some anchor sentences. So now we know how to deal with uh, new event types in new domains. Uh, let's talk about cross-lingual transfer. Uh, there are around 300 languages in the world, and most of them are low resource languages due to the difficulty of an IE annotation. So it's very important for us to perform cross-lingual transfer for these low resource languages. The first step is to build a multilingual common space. Uh, one thing we noticed is that entities are very different from words. So if you only use regular word embeddings, you won't be able to distinguish them. And you also won't know how to put several tokens together into phrases. As a result, we take advantage of Wikipedia, uh, the multilingual encyclopedia, um, and we can replace each entity text with its anchor link in the Wikipedia. Uh, for example, the word Apple here is replaced with the Apple Incorporate entity in the English Wikipedia. In this way, we can use these uh, entities as anchors and uh, map the Chinese embedding space into English embedding space. The same process can be applied to any languages as long as it's covered by the uh, multilingual encyclopedia. So we can uh, get a nice multilingual joint word and entity embedding. A common space is not enough uh, since relations and events usually involve wide context. So you need to figure out how these entities are connected to each other and how the entities and event triggers are connected to each other. For example, here, if you look at this English sentence and this Russian sentence, you can clearly see that the subtree covering trigger and arguments almost look identical. So even though their word orders might be different in different languages, but their local structures will look very similar and they are involved in the same type of relations and uh, events. So this discovery encourages us to convert a sentence into a dependency structures. And the, uh, the reason that we use dependency structure is because uh, the nice universal dependency passing community has already developed the universal dependency passer for more than 70 languages. After dependency passing, we use one graph neural network to map the graphs of different languages into one common space. Uh, each node will be initiated using multilingual joint word and entity embedding, and then uh, it will incorporates the information from its neighbors using graph neural, uh, graph neural networks. Then we can train a model for structure prediction. For example, we can consider event argument row as an edge between an entity node and an uh, event node. Then we can train this model use, uh, using English training data and apply it to other languages. For example, we apply this train model from English to Chinese, and we can get almost the same performance compared to the supervised model. Uh, this supervised model uh, in the experiment is trained on 3,000 Chinese event mentions. That means we can use this idea to reduce the lot of cross-lingual transfer cost. Okay, that's about uh, cross-lingual structure transfer. Uh, inspired by this great success, we try to use a similar idea to cross-media cross transfer. So now this news are presented using multimedia data and the information from text and image are complementary. For example, the stretcher here used to move soldiers is not explicitly expressed in text. So it can only be extracted from image. Uh, however, most of the work on event extraction focuses on text side, ignoring information from the vision side. As a result, a new task is proposed to conduct uh, multimedia event extraction. It extracts events and their arguments from multimedia documents, and the input contains a text article and the image uh, associated with this article. Uh, each output event and the argument can come from either text or image or both of them. 
In this, in this example, the trigger word deploy and the image are about the same transfer event. And the agent destination and artifact arguments can be extracted from text, but the vehicle can only be extracted from image. There are some work in computer vision community to extract events, but with a different focus on physical events in daily life scenario, like clipping, jumping, this kind of daily life verbs. Uh, so it has a gap with complex events in traditional text event extraction. Uh, in text event extraction, we focus more on the high level events like transport, protest, uh, and so on. So, um, they have a gap between these two uh, modalities. But the good news is that some work offers uh, resources similar to event argument extraction. For example, in situation recognition, one image is classified to a verb and it populates a table with nouns as arguments. But, it, uh, but it's different from our work. It does not localize the arguments in the image. To perform a multimedia joint event extraction, the key step is to understand the semantic structures of both modalities. If we consider vision as a second language, similar to multilingual common space, we can construct a multimedia common space. And in this common space, the text and image can be aligned through multiple levels. For example, the entity in the text can be aligned to visual object and event triggers can be aligned to visual activities. So similar to linguistic structures in text, we want to extract a semantic structure from image. On the text side, we extract the MR graph, which is a graph uh, constructed by predicates and their arguments. On the vision side, we mimic it by representing an image as a predicate node. It shows uh, the situation of the image. Uh, so it try to represent what is going on in the image. And uh, then we can connect it uh, with objects in the image. Uh, and these objects can be regarded as the potential arguments of this predicate. And in this graph, uh, we call it situation graph since it shows the situation of the image. Once we have these two graphs from text and image, uh, and these two graphs are kind of carrying uh, similar semantics, we develop a joint training framework to encode them into a same common space. Uh, in this common space, the nodes with similar semantics should be close to each other. For example, the ruin from the image and attack from the text should be close to each other because they are referring to the same event. Since we use publicly available AM parser to generate AMRs, AMR graph from text. The main question for us uh, will be how to generate the situation graph and how to build the common space. To solve the first question, we developed two methods. Uh, the first one is object-based graph. We apply the object detector to extract the objects and apply uh, CNN to extract their features. And then we use a projection layer to map them into world space. So the projected image is optimized to be close to its situation verb. Uh, similarly, the objects are mapped to nouns. And then we apply a row classifier to determine the rows of the objects. This method is limited to predefined object uh, classes. If an object cannot be detected, then we will miss it as argument. In order to solve this problem, we propose row-driven attention graph. So here we apply attention mechanism to localize each argument row in the image. And then each entity has a localized feature vector. Uh, we can project this feature vector into world space. And this method increases the record by extracting arguments that are not covered by the object detector, uh, such as stones and bomb. So um, it can cover more objects. But the drawback is that uh, it cannot generate precise bounding boxes. And to answer the second question about how to construct multimedia common space, we apply graph convolution networks to project nodes in the graphs into our common space. To train such graph convolution networks, we use image caption pairs as supervision data. So traditional Cross-media alignment uses triplet loss to minimize the distance between image vector and caption vector, which cannot capture the structured information. 
to solve this uh, solve this problem, we learn a cost attention matrix between the image graph nodes and the text graph nodes. Uh, to optimize this cost attention matrix, we reconstruct the text vector using image nodes and uh, minimize the distance between original and reconstructed text vectors. Similarly, we can optimize the cost attention in a reverse direction by reconstructing the visual vectors using text nodes. With this situation graph generation and the common space construction, given any image or sentence, we can represent them using multimedia common representations, uh, such as the yellow nodes from the text and the blue nodes from the image. Since these nodes lie in the same space, we can use a shared classifier to classify nodes of both modalities. The text and image event extraction uh, use two training tasks. Uh, use, uh, so they are using different data. So we use ACE data for text training and use situation recognition data for image but they optimize one shared event and argument classifier simultaneously. Uh, the training does not need any parallel data. The magic here is that uh, we use the cross-media alignment, uh, and uh, this alignment is trained using image caption pairs. These image caption pairs are uh, crawled from a VOA news websites. Uh, so this training data set can, uh, it is, uh, this training data set comes for free, and we call it weekly aligned structured embedding framework. After training, we can process real multimedia documents. Uh, given one sentence and one image, we can pass them into graphs. Since they lie in the same common space, we can average the representations of trigger and image to predict the event type jointly, which is more accurate than predicting each modality independently, and we prove it in the experiments. In real multimedia documents, there are multiple sentences and images. We encode them into one common space and compare them using the alignment laws to decide whether the image and sentence are about the same event. We merge the arguments of preferential events uh, that are of the same event type. So this framework is flexible. We can input either text or image or both and output the events with arguments of the same ontology. In the experiments, we separate the annotated events into text-only events, uh, image-only events, and multimedia events based on whether the event is corresponding to a text trigger or an image or both. Um, the multimedia setting covers arguments from both modalities, so it's much harder than text-only and image-only extraction task. Our multimedia system outperforms the system trained on only text or image, and also the structure, the common space of two versions, uh, object graph-based version and attention graph-based version, they both achieve significant gains compared to flat embeddings. Cross-media even co-reference is also improved by the structured common space. Since our align alignment method considers the semantic structures of both modalities. These are some examples showing how image and text help each other. In the first example, the system detected as protest event, since the visual features of celebration and the protest are similar. However, with the surrounding text, the system knows that uh, it's not protest event. In the second example, if we only look at the sentence, the word search uh, is not be able to be classified as a rest event. But with the image clearly showing that this is an arrest event, the search can be extracted as a rest from text set. One interesting discovery is that uh, not only multimedia events benefit from multimedia training, but text-only and image-only event extraction are also improved. So for text-only events, the semantics of triggers varies largely in different contexts. For example, the, these four sentences are all mentioned a rest statement, and they have completely different context, but the corresponding images are similar. So when we learn a common space, those images can act as a hub uh, that can pull these text sentences close to each other. But in the text only training, we don't have the image caption alignment. So this text sentence will remain far apart and it will be harder for the system to classify them as the same event type. 
compared to cross-media flat embedding. Our structure, the common space, can capture the connections between visual objects. Uh, like in the first example, the person in the middle uh, is always the entity being arrested, but not the agent. To summarize, there are two main goals for information extraction systems. One is quality, so the system should have good performance. Another one is portability, so the system should be able to apply to any new domains, languages, and data modalities. And the supervised IE models achieve good quality, but suffer from the low portability. Uh, weekly supervised models improve the portability, but the quality drops a lot. And now with the knowledge of schemas, uh, both quality and the possibilities are, uh, and possibility are improved. This is a presentation of the first part. Thank you for listening. Okay, thanks, Manny, for this very rich talk about uh, event extraction. So uh, let's ha we have a couple of time to take uh, two or three questions. So the audience, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type a question if you have any. But actually, personally, I, I do have a question about uh, the schema induction part. So actually, we had this discussion with uh, among us uh, recently, but I think that's a kind of problem. We do not have a good answer. Uh, actually, curious about if you have thought about this. So when you induce schemas from documents, is there a good way? or some heuristics to decide whether that is a high quality schema or not? Um, so to evaluate the schemas, we uh, thought about different uh, tasks, like um, uh, for example, a good schema should cover a lot of uh, frequent patterns. So it should be able to reconstruct the instance graph um, it's like the schema is a, a skeleton of a story. And uh, when the um, each instance graph is constructed, it follows the uh, hidden knowledge of this uh, schema. And uh, uh, in this way, we can use the, it's kind of like perplexity to reconstruct the uh, instance graph mm -hmm. and uh, to evaluate whether the schema is good. And we can also count the uh, like coverage, like uh, given the schema graph, uh, we can evaluate the overlap between the schema graph and the instance graph and calculate the coverage. And also uh, some downstream tasks like event prediction um, can be used to evaluate the quality of schema. So uh, if mm -hmm. uh, we can predict the event that will happen next, or we can predict the event that uh, is happened before uh, and uh, is missing in the instance graph, then it can also uh, show that the schema is good. Thanks. Yeah, actually, I understand that downstream application is definitely important at the, at the same time. So do you think evaluating the quality of a schema is more like decided by some local properties of uh, uh, sub steps in the schema, for example, are the orders of events in a correct way or versus there's a probably more global way to assess the quality of a schema, for example, is the model recovered enough uh, salient or essential steps of a schema to accomplish the central topic of it, or both sides could be important. Mm, I think both of them are important. And uh, in the evaluation, um, if uh, we can predict the event, uh, then it's kind of evaluating the local knowledge. So. Uh, it's trying to predict the event given like several events happened before. And for the um, perplexity, like uh, if we want to reconstruct the entire instance graph, then only the schema uh, captures the salient events, then it can recover a lot of uh, instance graphs. So uh, to recover the entire instance graph, we need to capture the global uh, picture of the schemas. Thanks, Manny. And also I see that there's a question from Sean Chen asking, are you aware of any event extraction application in the industry and what methods are they using? Mm. So 
uh, for inventory extraction uh, in industry, I think. Um, um, we can talk about the IBM work. You did an internship there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So for um, the uh, inventory extraction, I think it kind of like a basic uh, technique to represent the documents. And uh, we can uh, get the structured graph from the unstructured data so that we can support a lot of tasks. Like uh, my intern working in IBM is trying to do timeline generation. So uh, given a lot of news articles, like uh, the news article from uh, uh, one year and uh, uh, related to some like a uh, complex, complex event like Hong Kong protest, then uh, there will be a lot of documents. And if we want to generate a timeline, the traditional uh, abstractive summarization model, like this kind of neural model, will not be able to use the, because uh, the large size of the input uh, documents and also the, uh, it lacks the capability to capture the time dimension. So what we did is that we tried to construct the event graph uh, from the input documents. So in this way, we can um, transform the text only corpus to uh, structure the graph uh, like knowledge base. And then we can uh, do the timeline generation as a graph compression task. So we compress the event graph uh, to select the salient event nodes. And after that, we can generate the timeline according to the compressed event graph. So this is uh, trying to apply the uh, event extraction to uh, news data, trying to transform the uh, entire corpus into a structured knowledge base. I think this kind of uh, like large corporal representation using event graphs can be used to support a lot of downstream tasks like uh, uh, not only for timeline generation, but also for um, question answering and also for uh, something like hypothesis generation, trying to find uh, hypothesis from large documents. Yeah, thanks, Mani. I think definitely timeline generation is a very important application in lots of areas you would imagine. You want to extract the evolution of events to this kind of more concise but better curation. And also I could imagine, you know, this is this potentially could be a good way to summarize the data from, I say, clinic, clinical reports mm -hmm. to say to uh, help the clinicians generate more easily, more readable, uh, curations of uh, how a disease ev evolve and or how a, a treatment of a uh, patient is uh, in progress. Yeah, but anyway, that's definitely a very important and it will be great as application, both in industry and in very specialized area. But yeah, thanks, Manny. So let's now move on to Chiang for the second part of uh, event centric information extraction which is mostly about event event relations. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Muhao. Uh, let me try to take the screen. Okay. Hello everyone, can you all see my screen? Muhao, can you confirm for me? Okay, yes, cool. Good. Cool, all right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chiang Ning. I'm from Amazon, and I'm going to discuss event-to-event -event relationship extraction in natural language processing. Um, we have seen how events are defined and represented in the previous part. Uh, we must see that events are not isolated, and there are various types of relationships between them. For instance, there are co-reference relations, temporal relations, parent-child relations, and causal relations. Let me give you an example. AAAI 21 is held virtually due to the pandemic. Its attendees are thus giving remote presentations of their research. Here are all of the events marked in colors. And I'm going to give you a few example relationships between them. For instance, the pandemic uh, causes held virtually. Um, 
and held virtually causes giving remote presentations. Next, this it is actually referring to the conference being held virtually, which is AAAI. And also giving remote presentations is definitely one of the very important events of the conference of AAAI. And held virtually, temporarily, happens during the pandemic. And their research happens before giving remote presentations. Uh, this cannot be the other way around. Um, so these event-to-event -event relationships are often the key for understanding stories. Basically, all of these relations I have just read are those relations that we care about. And that's the understanding we have generated in our minds about this story. We know that the same events can actually tell a different story if their relations are different. This is a passage we just saw and where I want to highlight two relations, held virtually causes giving remote presentations and their research happens before the presentations. Note purely based on this passage, we actually don't know the relation between their research and the pandemic because the research may have happened before the pandemic started or it may happen during the pandemic. We're just not sure about it. This is a new passage. Uh, we can see the events are the same, but the story is different. It tells us that it's not held virtually causes remote presentations, but it's the fact that people want to give remote presentations that causes held virtually. In addition, this time, we are sure that this research is happening during the pandemic. So that we can see a different story based on the same set of events purely because of the different relationships. Now, I'm going to give a general problem statement. So event-event relationships is that we are given a piece of text and the indicator of two events. And based on our earlier presentation, uh, you may remember that it's gonna be head phrases of those two events. And the task is to extract the relationship between this event pair. Most works focus on one type of relationship. For instance, only predicting co-reference relationships or only do temporal relations. But nothing actually prevents ours from predicting multiple times at the same time. Since this is a standard relation extraction task, one can also use um, precision and recall to evaluate a system's performance. Another setting, probably more complicated, is to present many events. And instead of only looking at one event pair, this time one can look at all event pairs in the given context. Since these relations connect many events together, we can consider multiple events and consider their relation extraction problem jointly. There are corresponding metrics like B3, MUC, and temporal awareness that consider global coherence. Of course, there are also many works discussing these metrics and how to improve, although discussions over metrics are not covered in my talk today. Finally, since in practice, we're not given those events a priori, we need to extract the relations as well as those events in the first place. And naturally, there are works solving this problem jointly and applying metrics that consider event extraction errors as well. Above is what I'm going to discuss today. There are arguably other tasks such as uh, story close, script learning, schema induction, timeline construction, et cetera, that can also be considered as the relationship between one single event and a bunch of others. But I will not cover those, ta those tasks here. Speaking of event to event relationship extraction, there are several challenges. First, events are interrelated due to the transitive property of all kinds of relations. For instance, uh, in co-reference relation extraction, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then we know A must be equal to C as well. In temporal relations, if A is before C, B is before C, if A is before B and B is before C, then we can infer that A must be before C as well. And the same thing happens for parent-child and causality. Uh, note, I put a star sign um, after causality it's just because, uh, strictly speaking, in that if A leads to B and B leads to C, then A is not the cause of C in general causality discovery literature. But in NLP, we're kind of not very rigorous here, uh, so we can still apply constraints like that. 
Um, this is a real example from temporal relationship, relationship extraction. We can see the complex structure when these events are connected by so many temporal relations. We will get back to these challenges. The second challenge is that there are also many cross-relation type connections. For instance, um, coreference relationships often tells us that if A is a coreference of even B, the other relations that A has must be the same as those that B has. And for parent-child relationship, we know if A is a parent of B, it means A is enclosing B. So the time span of A must also include the time span of B. And the same thing happens for causal relationship versus temporal relationship. Uh, for instance, AAAI is held virtually due to the pandemic. And we know the pandemic causes held virtually. This is a causal relationship. And because of this relationship, we want to enforce another temporary relationship, which is a pandemic happens before held virtually. So these, these are this is an example that there could be uh, implications and constraints across different relation types. The third challenge, which is often more and more nuanced when we dive deeply into the problem, is from events themselves. Events may have components like agents, locale, time span, and they can also have different modes like negation, uncertainty, hypothesis, reputation, and generosity. This challenge is a little hard to explain in a short tutorial, but I will give a couple of more examples and hopefully they will help. So this challenge will often lead to many difficult cases when we design relation formalisms. Here is one example. Um, researchers went to New York to give presentations in AAAI in 2020. So we know that uh, give presentations is the cause of went, but also give presentations happen after went. As we just saw, shouldn't uh, the cause happen before the effect? Um, of course, one may quickly come up with an explanation for why this is happening, but in practice, or at least in my experience, we often end up seeing too many corner cases like this and having a hard time fixing these issues in our linguistic theory or formalism. Here's another example. He used to take a walk up dinner. And the second, he took a walk up dinner today. Uh, so what happens after dinner in both sentences, but are these the same relationship? Um, we may save the answer later, but what if I come up with the next example? He used to take a walk up dinner, but today he took a walk beforehand. Uh, the point here is, let's check what, if I ask you what's the relation between the first dinner and the second walk, what's the relationship? Uh, one may argue that there are many relationships or maybe there does not exist any relationship between these two events. But the point here is due to the complexity here, we see a lot of exceptions. For instance, how do we define whether two events should or should not have, an, have a relationship between them? In practice, how to design an elegant formalism with as few exceptions as possible is often the most difficult part in solving event-event relationship extraction. I'll back, get back to these challenges later. So a quick recap, the three challenges are um, events are interrelated. And um, the second, different types of relations are also interrelated. And third, event itself is a complex concept with many components and can have different modalities. I think a key word in existing works trying to solve these challenges is joint. That is taking into consideration the structural constraints between multiple events, multiple relation types, and even properties and extraction. Here is, uh, I'm trying to summarize how we are handling them in, in these existing works. And when we, are hand, when we are taking into consideration multiple events, typically we are handling uh, those transitivities or those other constraints within each relation type. And when we consider multiple relation types, we want to consider across those different relation types, what can those implications be? And the third one, how do we define events? How do we jointly extract events and relations? These are the general directions that the literature has been working through. And here I'm using uh, T, C, E, P to represent temporal, causal, coreferential, and parent-child. And this is my tentative summary of the literature. Some of early works 
uh, very pioneer works. They are not exploring any of the direct dimensions here, but there are some other works that are exploring things in each along each axis. For instance, here I have color coded. Um, there are a lot of works taking into consideration the events that are forming graphs uh, when we are handling temporal relationship extraction. And the same thing happened for when, when people are handling multiple event co-reference relationships. And some other works are handling both multiple events and cross relation types. And here you can see most of the, all of the works here receive multiple tokens. Uh, people are considering both temporal relationships and causal relationships. And people are also con considering both temporal uh, parent child and co-reference relationships and so on and so forth. And finally, there are also works trying to combine multiple events and also event extraction. For instance, in causality extraction, in temporal relation extraction, and also in co-referential relation extraction. I put, I put star signs here because these two works are not using event extraction to help even co-reference, but on the other way around. But I still include all of these works for your reference. You will find the titles of these papers later in my talk today. So uh, my tentative summary for all of the, these works is that the general methodology is to find structures in data or in task and enforce the structure in inference or in learning, and also investigate the underlying linguistic formalism. I would like to mention that this is just a summary from NLP's perspective. And if one views everything from a machine learning perspective, it'll be definitely different. Okay, so um, here's one example of how we enforce these structural constraints in practice. This is a temporal relation extraction problem. And we see due to transitivity, temporal relationships are not independent. Assume that we are looking at ripping, cascaded and ordered. Then because ripping is, insi is inside cascaded and cascaded is before ordered, the relation between ripping and ordered must be before. One way to take this constraint into, into account is called global inference which means that when we do inference, we want to respect those transitive constraints um, in practice. That is, assuming that we have a model and the model is already trained, then for a pair of events, the model will produce the confidence or softmax score for each label. Based on these confidence scores, we solve for the final temporal graph. Here is a toy example. The naive way is to select the best score for each edge. Uh, so to simplify, I'm using only before and after. That's why I'm only using arrows to point, to annotate to those relationships. So assuming we are only to select the best score for each edge, then we will get monitor before cascaded, cascaded before ordered, and then order before monitor. And we got a loop. However, time cannot be a loop. How should we avoid this situation? The answer is we should not only select the alignment with the best score, but also avoid loops. For instance, we act to avoid loops, we actually have three options as shown here. And in all of the three options, we don't have loops. And we sum up all of the scores for all of the graphs and we select the best one. In this case, this is the middle one. So the global inference procedure is often formulated as an integer linear programming problem or ILP. Of course, there are also some other ways, but today I'm going to describe uh, one approach, which is ILP here. So here is an example, uh, ILP formulation for temporary relation extraction. Uh, but of course the method is general. Here we have two types of, of variables, uh, Boolean variable I indicating the relation between event I and event J and real variable F uh, representing the confidence of scores for each relation. We sum them up, enforce the no loop constraint and that's our mathematical formulation of this global inference via ILP problem. Uh, so a, a key step here is how do we understand this constraint? Recall these IRs are binary variables. So if both IR1 and IR2 are one, then IR3 must be one due to this constraint. Otherwise, if any one of the two Boolean variables are not one, then the third one is not constrained at all. It's free to choose from either zero or, or, or one. In practice, when we are designing these temporal relationships, 
we need to draw a lot of diagrams and try to come up with the reasoning rules and write down those relationship constraints. This is a set of constraints we used in an earlier work in ACL 2018. Um, and where we can see R1 means the relationship between even one and even two. R2 is that between even two and even three. And the relation between even one and even three has to be chosen from the list here. And here I have relation labels as before, after, and including, included simultaneously and vague. And we can see the relationships here. Um, please refer to the, to the paper for more details. I'm not reading out all of them here. Um, but based on these constraints, here's another question. Uh, what if R3 has multiple choice? This is shown in the table we just saw in the, in the previous slide. Uh, but how, how do we handle this situation? It turns out that this situation is very easy because a very small extension is to add a summation score, a summation sign before the third variable. And we should, allow, we should only allow IR3s to be chosen from a set of candidates. This is how we enforce multiple choices in the transitivity constraints. Another question is what if we want to enforce constraints across different relation types? So far, we have only seen uh, in that table, those are all temporal relationship constraints. But what if I want to enforce cross relationship constraints, for instance, temporal and causal? It turns out to be still pretty straightforward. Uh, on the left, that was the formulation for temporal only. And for the right, it's temporal and causal. Uh, we can see that uh, the only change is that we need to add an extra term on, on graph scoring function and add this extra constraint making in purple, making sure that whenever even i is a cost of even j, that even i must be before j as well. This is the, the extension for how do we handle multiple choices or how do we handle cross relationship, uh, cross type relationship constraints. To drive this idea home, a recent work at EMLP 2020 takes three types of event event relationships in one framework, namely temporal relationship, uh, parent child, which is called sub event, and coreference. Recall that the same events, which are captured by event coreference, should share the same relationships to other events. And parent events temporarily contains those child events. The constraint table in that, in that paper is a little bit more complicated than the one we saw in the, in the earlier paper in ACL 2018. But again, here R far means the relation between even one and two, and beta is the relation between uh, two and three. And the main body of the table is the choices left for the relation between one and three. And we can enforce these constraints in a global inference as well. Um, I'm not going to explain all of the location, all of the uh, labels here. Please refer to the table for more details. Um, so far, we have assumed that a model is already given to us, and all we care about was to uh, do the global inference. Um, the next question is, how do we get this model? How do we train it? Some prior works have been using uh, local learning. And by local learning, it means during learning, we don't care about the structure. We decompose the graph into individual edges and feed them into the learning algorithm one by one. The algorithm can be neural nets and it can be anything, but it's still local learning. Our argument here is that local learning is not sufficient. In the previous example, imagine a learning algorithm is looking at this pair, ripping and ordered. So ripping into houses off the ground, firefighters order the evacuations, and so on and so forth. Even for humans, when we look at the local context, we don't know the relation between rip, ripping off the ground and ordered evacuation. But the annotation says, the label is before. So let's update the parameter to fit it. And we know this is actually overfitting. If we bring in a third event, cascaded, and since we know ripping and cascaded is included, and cascaded is before ordered, then immediately we know ripping is before ordered. We don't really, re we don't really need the local model to tell us. So again, we can mitigate the overfitting problem in this graph. Again, the question is how should we formulate it? And this turns out to be a very general um, uh, line of work called structure learning. Here, this is a standard structure learning problem. And uh, we use perceptron as an example to do a side-by-side -side comparison. On the left, it's a standard perceptron. And the right is a structured perceptron. In local learning, an instance is a single pair of events. But in global learning, it's an entire 
graph, maybe a paragraph, maybe a graph, uh, maybe a document. Uh, local learning is unaware of the decisions in other pairs, while in global learning, because of the special step uh, using ILP, we inject the knowledge brought by those constraints. So this learning algorithm is aware of other pairs thanks to the global inference step in between. Um, so another way to enforce the structures in learning, but in a softer way, is used in the same paper in NLP 2020, uh, where they softened the constraints and added them into the loss to minimize. This is obviously also a clever way to do structure learning. And I'm, I'm not going to detail out everything here. Uh, so finally, this is a summary of the progress in temporal relation extraction over the recent three years. Um, the setup is that events are given. So now the state of the art is roughly in the high 70s. So we can see that in the beginning, this was roughly seven years ago, which is a system called Cable. Uh, it was the previous state of the art. It was roughly before, it was before below 15. And using structure learning and using some other techniques, we are constantly seeing improvements over the years. And finally, we, with the BERT, we can see even, even more improvements and some other structures uh, happening in the recent two years. And the, just now, the EMLP 2020 paper is, uh, is a new state of the art. It's getting even another 2% gain uh, in, in this data set. Uh, using the language in this talk, the improvements are actually coming from uh, considering multiple events, uh, considering multiple relation types, and uh, from better representations. There is another thing uh, we are going to discuss next, uh, the new linguistic formalism. You can see that's roughly the biggest improvement uh, down the road. Uh, this is about more discussions over event properties and how do we really define events. So uh, we know time is one dimension physically, um, but, the, but the argument in this paper was multiple time axes may actually exist in uh, natural language. For instance, police tried to eliminate the pro-independency army and restore order. At least 51 people were killed in clashes between uh, police and citizens. Um, and we have realized, uh, I, I'm omitting a lot of the details and a lot of the reasoning why we come up with this scheme, but I'm just giving the result. Um, so we realized that uh, we can put events to different axes, for instance, the main axis and so, another so-called intention axis. And this police trial event is actually the intersection between the two events. And one of the major observations we have made in this work was whenever we are comparing two events on the same axis, it's relatively easy. People can easily agree on the relationship between them. However, if we compare events from different axes, that's where the disagreement, disagreements are coming from. Uh, because, because we are comparing two different things, uh, we have to make the projection. And different people are projecting them onto different places and that's why we sometimes get before, sometimes we get after. Let's get back to the earlier example about uh, shouldn't the cause happen before the effect. Um, actually, if we apply the formalism of multiple axes here, we can see that give presentations is on the intention axis. So uh, of course you can give a lot of names to it, but it doesn't actually conflict with the physics on the main axis at all. So this is one, um, one way to explain why we are seeing these these corner cases that used to be difficult. And this is the second example. He used to take a walk up dinner and he took a walk up dinner today. If we draw uh, the timeline, we could see that the relationships are actually different in the, in the sentences before, uh, in the above two sentences. This phenomena isn't very popular in practice. Uh, so there is already, there is still no linguistic formalisms, formalisms capturing these kind of nuances so far. But in a recent data set we collected, we showed that these phenomena are easily distinguished if we use the QA format. For instance, we can ask what did he often do at dinner versus what did he do at dinner today? This is easily distinguishing between the two uh, phenomena here. Um, this new data set is called Torque. Uh, it was published in EMMP 2020 as well. Uh, interest readers can refer to that paper for more details. But here I would like to show that if we further pre-train on torque, uh, we can get new state of the art result on, on the data set um, as well. Uh, so here the orange line is we are using Roberta. We fine tune it on torque first and then fine tune it on matters. So matters is the, is the new data set I just mentioned uh, with multiple access. 
Uh, so, and this, this blue line is Roberta fine tuned on mattress directly. So this is our baseline. Uh, we can see uh, if we fine tune uh, the system on torque first, we can see a significant, account, a significant amount of transfer learning happening there. So, so far, um, let's, let me give a summary. Uh, so event between, uh, so even event the relationships are important for story understanding. Remember the example where we can use the same set of events to describe a different situation. Uh, and event relationship extraction is difficult uh, because uh, within those relations, there are uh, complex structures and across different types of relations, there are also influences coming from each other and event formalisms are naturally difficult to define. And a keyword in existing work solving these uh, challenges is joint. Um, and the basic methodology was to find event structures and enforce these structures in inference and slash all in learning. Uh, but the more important problem often lies in how should we define these relations and more fundamentally, what is an event? Uh, so far, that's my talk. Thank you a lot for your attention. And these are the references only mentioned in this talk. And thanks for your attention again. Uh, questions are very welcome. And thanks, Chang, for the very thorough summarization of the recent advances on this line of research. Yeah, so we can probably take one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have a question. Uh, thanks, Chang, for the next talk. Uh, I actually have a long, I have a question about the event relation models for a long time. Like, what do you think are we learning from this training process? The knowledge or some linguistic cues that can determine there is a certain relation between events in this local context or both maybe. Oh, can you, can you rephrase your question? Are you, are you saying, are we uh, learning these cues the or knowledge? these knowledges? Yeah, basically. I, I just don't see the clear boundary between your definition of knowledge and cues, but I, I guess, um, right. do you mean constraints? No, the knowledge is basically means like uh, some common sense knowledge, like you are more like to first being hungry and then you are eating. So this is kind of knowledge, but for some linguistic cues, I basically mean some connectives or some other phrases. Like if this sentence says that even A, then even B, then there is a clear temporal relation. So okay. yeah, yeah. So um, like uh, even A is often before even B that is uh, encoded in this probabilistic prior. Uh, so I tend to categorize that as a soft constraint over these events. Uh, so I, I may, explain things in, in, in this. So uh, to understand or to extract, for instance, to extract temporal relations, uh, we need background knowledge, which means mm -hmm. even, even before we read the text, we should expect that a, a bombing should be followed by carotis uh, and hungry should be followed by eating, things like this. Um, and on the other hand is th those cues we see in text and uh, for instance, if there is an explicit marker saying something A is happening before something B, then we should definitely capture that. And in the progress we have made in the past three or four years, we have definitely considered both, uh, both directions. Okay. So either way is not enough. Uh, a following up question for this is that, like, do you think language models has already captured those prior knowledge? Yeah. That's a very good, good question. So, um, in, so one thing uh, that I didn't have chance to expand was this Siamese network here. That's actually a, uh, another, you can assume that's a system telling you the, uh, the, 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 probab the chance that even A is before even B, purely based on the event token. Um, and we can see in that study that it was uh, in, 20, in 2019, we, we were able to see a, a statistically insignificant gain over BERT. So that could mm -hmm. reflect that there is still some knowledge that is not captured in BERT. Um, and speaking of this um, typical temporal ordering, for instance, uh, I, I guess it's also gonna be captured by your talk later, is temporal common sense. And we can, see, uh, we can see there definitely that BERT is not understanding all of the temporal common sense as well. Of course, it's already a significant step over previous systems, but still it's not enough. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks both. And uh, also I have one, probably another short question. So consider that uh, 
events are actually something more complex than entities because they have internal structures. So somehow I would think labeling uh, event event relations for training corpus could be kind of more difficult. So in that case, do you think there could be some uh, good ways to help the model in this kind of possibly noisy learning, noisy label learning scenario? Um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, there are two things. One is, um, for instance, this is the torque data set and I'm mentioning, uh, you can see here, this is roughly like a few shot setup uh, where we have just uh, a few hundred training examples for the target data set, but we can still see a lot of uh, improvement um, gained from uh, fine tuning on torque. So, uh, and also there are recent works on uh, using QA to extract events and this torque paper was an example of using QA to extract the relations as well. Uh, there are definitely also ongoing works to extract other event event relations, I, I believe. Um, so uh, the second thing is noisy. Uh, so because if you use QA, it could also be noisy because the crowd workers or the annotators could be uh, not understanding the job very well. And in the in the in the old days when we are labeling things by experts, there could also be noises. It's not because those experts were not careful enough. It's because the formalisms were so hard. Uh, it requires a lot of training. And also sometimes uh, it's just cannot, it just cannot capture all of the nuances in these phenomena. So this is uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, but definitely, we see that uh, looking into the format of these training data and try to use uh, transfer learning and study how do we do domain adaptation and how do we do uh, learning from QA pairs to solve our linguistic task, that's definitely a very important direction, I think. Yeah, thanks. I do agree that because thinking about this as an emerging research area, so definitely there are lots of challenges regarding, in addition to noisy label learning, perhaps also learning with limited labels or resource hungry, that sort of methods would also be I would think those are potentially lots of important but open research directions to foster further studies, I guess. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah, thank you all for the for the um, excellent questions. Okay, thanks. Ciao again. Uh, so let's probably move on to the next session, which is mine. Okay, so can you all see my presentation? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, uh, thanks again for uh, coming to this tutorial. Uh, I'm presenting the third technical part, which is about understanding event processes in natural language. I'm Muha Chen from, I'm currently at uh, USC. So, in this session uh, of tutorial, we will focus on machine comprehension of event processes. So this part is particularly about several key challenges of, for example, how to model and predict the evolution of events and uh, how do we infer the intentions and the consequences of event processes and also how should the knowledge of uh, this kind of uh, event evolution help downstream tasks of uh, human language understanding and also computer vision. So uh, the first message here is that human languages, we do think that they always communicate about the progress of events. Uh, for example, when we talk about, uh, let's say earning a PhD degree, we can talk about so many events, including uh, starting from fulfilling the course requirement to passing the qualification exam until we defend the dissertation. Right? And uh, definitely uh, understand the natural language by the machines should also involve understanding this kind of evo evolution of events. I think in previous sessions, Mani and the Chan have introduced a lot about how event-centric information extraction could help automatically recognizing and typing events and also identifying the relations between uh, pairs of events. But based on that, to fully understand the events, uh, with extraction in, only is not in, enough. This is because events are not simple static predicates. Uh, events actually form processes. For example, we do know that uh, we, uh, the student, PhD student, 
need to pass the qualification exam only after fulfilling the course requirement, which may further lead to dissertation proposal. And also events are described in different granularities, which means that some course grained events, for example, publish a paper may include more fine grained processes of writing a paper, passing the peer review until uh, presenting at the conference. Right? And also, uh, event processes are often directed by specific intents or central goals. For example, all the events at here, we know that they are all directed by the single goal of earning a PhD degree. So in this part of talk, we will focus on the event process, which is modeled as a set of partially ordered events that are centered around a common protagonist. For example, uh, we have this process of uh, earning a PhD degree and that requires the protagonist, which is the student, to fulfill the course requirement passing the qualification exam again until filing the dissertation. Yeah, so this is a concrete example of an event process. And around the event process, we do have several fundamental prediction problems. For example, we do expect the system to uh, perform event process completion, which means that given a partially complete process, the system should predict what should happen next. And also there's the problem of intention prediction that concerns whether the machine understand that the process of digging a hole, putting some seeds in the hole and fulfilling the hole with soil is a process of uh, planting a plant. And there's also a membership prediction uh, problem, which is about does the machine understand what should be the steps of uh, uh, buying a car and also salience prediction, which means that does the machine understand that as here, defending the dissertation, filing the dissertation, they are more important than, for example, doing an internship in terms of any PhD. And in fact, understanding event processes and making reasonable prediction is essential to many real world natural language understanding tasks. Let's take an example of a narrative prediction. So suppose we have this uh, incomplete story about a boy as visiting his aunt, but later he got jealous about his uh, sisters and took a bite on his sisters. And what should be the uh, reasonable consequence after that, right? There are two options. One is he was scolded. The other is uh, the aunt, uh, his aunt, uh, she gave him a cookie for being so nice. So think about one easy way to solve this problem is to keep track of the evolution of events in this story. Clearly we know that after getting jealous and being angry and took a bite, this is more reasonable to be followed uh, by being scolded rather than getting a cookie as a reward. And similarly, in machine comprehension, we may often see cases where understanding a piece of text from, let's say, a biological uh, a scientific article that is centered around understanding a biological process. For example, in this article, we do see that uh, there's a process about a light absorbed, which leads to water is split, then further leads to transfer of the electrons and the hydrogen ions. So in this context, to understand this kind of biological article and perhaps answer this kind of question, what can the splitting of water lead to? This is essentially supported by understanding the biological event process in this article. Uh, so in the rest of the talk, I will split the technical content into four parts. Uh, we'll first focus on uh, recent progress of event process completion and the pro problem of event intention prediction. And also I will introduce some uh, downstream applications in natural language and also computer vision, which are supported by understanding event processes. And also I will spend a few minutes talking about some open research directions that are specifically related to event processes. So let's first look at the problem of uh, event process completion. So I would say there are two different definitions of event process completion. Uh, one is that uh, given a partially complete process, a system is required to predict the missing steps or perhaps most of the time predicting the future steps. And the second definition is uh, given a coarse grain event as an objective, a system tries to predict the entire process from scratch. So for the first definition, one of the earliest attempts to, let's say, automatically completing event processes 
uh, is published by uh, Chambers and Jorowski in 2008. So this pioneering work seeks to conduct unsupervised event process completion based on corpus statistics. So the principle is that uh, given a very large corpus, so in that work, the authors used uh, 11 years of gigawatt. And the system captures the co-occurrence of events based on, in the same local context, based on their PMI. Then during the inference, given a partially complete process, the next step, uh, the next event is predicted to be the one which maximizes the accumulated PMI. So here we have an example of prediction given by their system. We can see that, let's say, given uh, prior steps of uh, pleaded, admitted, and also convicted, it is likely that this is followed up by sentenced, paroled, and fired. So in the same work, the authors also show that the event process completion leads to as much as 36% of improvement on the NYT narrative close test uh, over the best baseline over that time, which actually kind of uh, pointed out that this kind of uh, event process knowledge is essential to narrative prediction. So there are several significant works that follow Chambers and Jorofsky's design. So one of them is the work which is published by uh, Radinsky and uh, Horvitz in uh, 2013. So in this work, they extend this uh, unsupervised learning of event chains to cross document scenario. That is to say, given us, let's say six, six month span of New York time articles, the system first identify uh, topically uh, cohesive documents around a period of time then from the titles of these documents, a maximum cross entropy model uh, captures the co-occurrence of events through a chain, which has a similar effect than, uh, as the PMI based model in Chambers' paper. Then the technology here is later applied to predict possible uh, forthcoming news along the timeline, which is kind of uh, related to Manning's uh, internal working IBM. So let's say the system can predict something like uh, the, the, the likelihood of uh, cholera rising is high after a drawout followed by storms in Angola. Yeah. And these are some example works about uh, predicting forthcoming events after a part of uh, event process. So another, which is more challenging research question would be, can we introduce a new process for a goal without seeing a part of it? Say given a uh, objective of uh, buying a house, can we let the machine automatically induce all of its steps without knowing any of them beforehand? So this is actually a hard problem which we recently attempted in last year's EMLP paper. So the general idea is kind of straightforward. So basically we try to leverage analogous property of events and transfer the knowledge about some processes that are, we already know uh, to new processes we don't know. Actually, it mimics how human understand processes that we are not familiar with. For example, assume that one, have never, one has never bought a house, although one may already know how to buy a car or how to rent a house, then, intu then intuitively these relevant processes should contain lots of relevant steps. And based on those relevant steps, we may guess the necessary steps of buying a house even we do not really have the real experience. So this is the overall framework of our system. So in the first step, given a goal, let's say buying a house, the system will find a group of uh, reference processes that either share the same predicate or share the same argument with the goal. For example, it will find lots of uh, processes about buying something and also lots of processes about uh, taking some action on the house. Then uh, the second step will try to uh, perform a event conceptualization technique, which generates a probabilistic abstract representation for each of this reference process. And in the end, all the abstract representation will be merged to find a common pattern, which will be further instantiated to get the final prediction of uh, the process for buying a house. So this is a kind of a high level idea. Also, I, I, I do not want to go too deep into the technical details, but here are some uh, key experimental results based on the event processes we extract from WikiHow. And from that, we can see that the current system can largely outperform some strong sequence to sequence generation methods, and uh, it still achieves uh, about a half of human performance. 
And on the right hand side, we see there's a case study about, let's say, given a central goal of treating the pain, the system can generate the process of uh, identifying symptoms, seeing a doctor, recognizing symptom, and uh, taking supplement, which is actually a very meaningful process to accomplish this central goal. But at the same time, as I said, this is a very challenging problem to generate a new process from scratch. So there are still, you know, much gap to be fulfilled between the machine performance and also human performance. So for interested uh, audience, we do refer you to uh, look at our resources, which is av available on this uh, European Qualcomm website. So next, next, let's look at the second problem of uh, event intention prediction. So the motivation of uh, in, uh, this line of research is that people can easily anticipate the intents and the possible reactions of uh, participants in events. For example, let's say there's an event, uh, person X cooks Thanksgiving dinner. We, 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 we may easily guess that, okay, the intention could be something like to impress uh, this person's family. And uh, also the reaction of this person could be, well, this person gets tired or, but he or she gets a sense of belonging. And also some reaction could be the family is impressed, right? So that, this is actually easy for human, but similarly, when we develop a common sense aware system, we would also expect the system to perform this kind of inference. And this problem is first attempted in the work Event to Mind, which is published by people from uh, UDA in 2018. So this event mind system is developed based on a large corpus, with a large cross-source contributed corpus, which contains around uh, 25,000 events and also free-form descriptions of their intents and rea reactions. And there's a model which is trained on the corpus to perform sequence to engram generation, which actually shows pretty good generalization to give free-form descriptions of uh, event intents. For example, given the event of a uh, person X cooks steak, it can predict some intentions like uh, to kill their hunger, to make dinner for the family, to eat the steaks and so forth. And also similar predictions about reactions and other people's reaction. Yeah. It is noteworthy that this uh, work, the, the resources that are contributed in this event to mind work are later, uh, you know, poster the important works in common sense inference, for example, atomic and the comet. And this work will be introduced by Homing in the next section of talk. So at the same time, we want to say that the intention prediction problem can also naturally apply to uh, event processes as well. And actually it is suggested by cognitive studies that a process of event is always defined by a specific central goal or intention of the performer. For example, when we see this process of uh, digging a hole, putting seeds in the hole and fill the hole with soil and water the soil, we easily know that, okay, this is a process of uh, planting a plant. And similarly, when we see a process of making a dough and add toppings to the dough and pre uh, preheat the oven and bake the dough, we, we can easily guess that this is likely to be a process of uh, cooking a pizza, right? So actually, we humans can always understand event processes by hypothesizing what should be the objective the process aim for and what should be the ultimate consequence the process seeks to accomplish. And naturally, we would also expect a common sense aware intelligent system to perform this kind of inference. So for that purpose, in this uh, 2020 work, we propose a new cognitively motivated semantic typing task for event processes, which aims to infer what should be the overall action the event process seeks to take and what should be the type of object the process seeks to affect. And to facilitate the research on this problem, we have contributed with a large data set of typed event process as well and with, as there's a effective hybrid learning framework, which is based on indirect supervision to address this problem. So the data set we extract is based on WikiHow, which is a large community website containing professionally edited guideline articles. And the data set come with more than uh, 60,000 event processes, and each of which comes with also a free form label of action and object type. So this is noteworthy that this data set poses a non-trivial learning problem, specifically the type system at here, 
has a very fi uh, fine grain uh, and also diverse type system. So with more than a thousand action types and also more than 10,000 object types. And also over 85% of the labels appear less than 10 times and also nearly one, uh, nearly a half of them are actually uh, one shot labels. And also in around 90% of the cases, we do find that the labels do not appear in the content of the event process, which means that if we apply a, simply apply an extractive system, it will easily fall short. So to solve this non-trivial problem, we propose a practical form of indirect supervision, which is based on gloss knowledge. That is to say, instead of predicting the type labels based on the event process content, we actually find it should be easier to predict the, cor uh, the correct WordNet gloss that defines the type label. This is due to that the semantic definition, the sense definition of type labels in WordNet provides richer semantic information than the label itself. Therefore, it is easier to seize on the association between a process gloss pair. And also we do find that the gloss provides useful side information to jumpstart representations of future labels that really seen or unseen in training. And this is the overall architecture of this uh, P2GT framework. So in training, we use a robot language model to encode the sequence of events. And also we use the same language model to encode the gloss of the label. And then to select the right gloss for a polysemious label, for example, you can think about if the label is a work or make, or it's a label about bank, there are different meanings. So for those cases, we actually also incorporate a pre-trained word sense disambiguation model. And the learning objective conducts the learning to rank, uh, which uh, is pre performed on both action and object types exercises. And the inference phase will rank the glosses of all labels in the corresponding type axis. So the results here show kind of promising performance, which leads to 3.4 to four folds of MR improvement over the Roberta based sequence label generator, which is actually similar to event to mine. And specifically, we do see that the indirect supervision at here, which is based on gloss knowledge, do bring the most improvement, which is about uh, 2.9 to 3.3 folds of uh, improvement on mean reciprocal rank. And we also see that joint training uh, also leads to notable improvement. Also, we do see that word sense disambiguation at here leads to lesser improvement. This is because the predominant senses often is representative enough to jumpstart the representation of a label. So these are some fi findings in experimentation. And then we also provide some case study to show that the system, how the system perform process typing on uh, event process extracted from the news domain, we do see that let's say given a process of uh, making explosive materials, obtaining a sharp nail, obtaining a container, and installing a trigger, this is likely to be the process of uh, assembling a grenade or assembling a blaster. Although it is clear that, that it is not possible for this kind of process to pre-exist in WikiHow. Right? And also at here, we mark those future labels that appear less than 10 times as blue, which indicates that by leveraging the gloss knowledge as indirect supervision, it helps the system to make less biased prediction. And for this work, we also build a web demo on, on the, which is actually available on Qualcomm website as well. So actually all those links, the data sets and resources and software and also demo is also included in the paper. So next I will give some introdu uh, introduction about uh, downstream tasks that are essentially supported by event process understanding. So one important direction is narrative prediction. So since event processes model the plausible evolution progress of events in a context, they can be naturally used to improve the consistency of the narrative prediction. So a narrative prediction task often requires a system to predict the possible continuation given a piece of narration. For example, here again, that's the example we have shown at the beginning. That's a story about a boy visits his aunt and uh, then the boy got jealous at his sister and took a bite on the sister, then the aunt got angry. So what should be the uh, plausible uh, 
continuation, one as he was scolded, the other as she gave him a cookie for being so nice. So in order to predict the plausible uh, ending, uh, the 2017 work by Snigdar actually trains a language model which captures three types of sequential features. There is a set of uh, event sequences from 20 years of New York data, New York time data, and the language, the language model captures the processes there, and also it captures the sentiment trajectory and also topical consistency. But actually in that work, that, uh, it points out that the event frequency is actually the most important feature with which alone is already going to give uh, very good performance. And at the same time, modeling event process is important for machine comprehension. So in this task, a system is required to answer some questions that are related to a given article. For example, uh, this example is taken from the award-winning paper in uh, EMLP 2014. So here to understand the biological uh, process described in the scientific literature, uh, the proposed method also extracts events and the event event relations in a biological process. And then the question answering is conducted as uh, matching the events in the question and the candidate answers with the extracted event processes from the uh, from, from, from the scientific literature. And it also shows that uh, by tracking this kind of event processes from an article, it's actually very important to improve this kind of challenging task. And another key application is video segmentation. So this task aims at understanding the content of a video, then splitting it into different relatively independent segments. So for example, given a video talking about making a pancake, it may be split into segments talking about background and different steps of uh, cooking. And so in this context, uh, in se several works, several recent works by Jukov and Fried, this problem is done by uh, first extracting the narration in the video, say so aligning the narration uh, to different steps of uh, WikiHow process, event process. So in this way, different steps in a WikiHow event process naturally serve as anchors for video segmentations. And also in the same area, there are also some recent works focusing on directly recognizing and modeling the event process in videos. For example, one recent work by our collaborators in Columbia University, they proposed to use hyperbolic embeddings to capture the event process in videos. So this is because uh, event processes of the same kind may branch into different possible paths of evolution. This naturally forms hierarchies that are naturally suitable to be captured with hyperbolic geometry. So this is actually a very nice work which has just been announced in, uh, on archive last month. So lastly, I have three pages of slides talking about a few open research directions that are focusing on event process understanding. So the first problem is salience detection in event processes. Previously, we have introduced the problem of intention prediction for event processes, but that here it is one unresolved but highly relevant problem, which is that events in a process is not equally important with regard to the central goal. For example, let's again take, the, uh, take a look at the process of planting a plant. We have these four steps, but if we remove the water in the soil, but we just preserve the steps of digging a hole, putting seeds in the hole and fill the hole with soil, we can still tell that this is a process of planting a plant. But on the contrary, if we remove the step of putting the seeds in, by just uh, seeing the step of uh, digging a hole, filling the hole with soil, then water the soil, it's, it's not possible for us to infer whether we are actually planting something or we are brewing something. And also we will not have an idea about what the something is, right? And in the same context, we know that in terms of earning a PhD, defending the dissertation is most important. Doing an internship, doing a TA ship is probably less important and doing an internship is most of the time optional. So on this problem, then the question would be, is there a way to automatically identify salient events in a process? And also at the same time, will this kind of knowledge help downstream tasks such as abstractive summarization? These are actually open problems, which we actually already started some investigations. 
And the second open problem is reasoning about ordering of events. So considering that events in a process may not be necessarily described in the same order in a document. So in that case, how to identify the correct orders of uh, member events in a process is also a unresolved challenge. So for this problem, there are two recent benchmarks. There are two recent test beds that are both published in EMLP. One is the Torque, which has been already covered by Charles Talk. That is a crowdsourced, uh, uh, crowdsourcing based uh, machine comprehension data set. And there's also a work which is extracted from WikiHow that is by Chris Callis and Birch group. And there are more tasks that could benefit from understanding event processes. Uh, so one relevant one, which is about uh, chatbots. So consider that we have already shown that event processes are important for narrative prediction. Then to go one step further, can we use this knowledge of uh, event process to improve the consistency of utterance generation or utterance retrieval for chatbots? This is also an important problem. And besides, it is also important to uh, develop reliable learning systems, which helps with understanding clinical event processes, such that the machines may use this kind of function to help clinicians with uh, expensive tasks, such as diagnostic prediction or disease phenotype prediction. So in this direction, I believe transfer learning and also structure prediction can be particularly important because you know, naturally in this area, we lack training uh, resources due to privacy issue and also there are dependencies between different phenotype and disease labels. So these are some key references that are, uh, that are appearing in this talk particularly. So thanks for your attention and uh, happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks Moha for the uh, comprehensive presentation. Do we have any questions? I guess due to the time, we may have time for one or two questions from the audience, maybe. Okay, so if no, I have a question. Like, do you think each event can be viewed as a process or we can find a prop appropriate level of kind of atomic events? Oh, I think that's a good question. So I would say uh, if we have a really comprehensive enough uh, representation of a really coarse grain event, for example, that's kind of relevant to the schemas that money is inducing. And granularity, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah granularity, yeah. So I do think uh, the most comprehensive way is definitely trying to think of uh, event processes as different levels of granularity. As I said, for example, if you have a process of any PhD, so over there, this, if you drill down one level, you publish papers, but for publishing papers, definitely it also contains different steps of uh, you need to first compose the papers and submit, submit it and then get it past peer reviews and also present it, right? So definitely I would say uh, the most comprehensive way to think about event process modeling is definitely modeling it into different levels of granularity. That's also relevant to uh, one part of chance talk, which is about predicting the membership or sub-event relations. Yeah, although at here, I would say lots of people start with uh, event process as a chain of events because it naturally fits lots of uh, uh, downstream applications concerning narrative prediction or maybe also chatbots. And uh, naturally it's also a mimic a way to mimic uh, evolution of events. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a question about audience that are the slides available? I guess yes. So maybe you can send the, the link sure. to the slides. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. I will send the link to that here and also to the online chat in the AAA website. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. Right. Thanks. We are on time. Okay. So if there's no more question, I will go to the next part, the fourth section. Uh, Maybe I can share screen. Oh, I need to stop sharing first, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just did. Uh... Let me check it, how should I do it? Um, oh. Is it working now? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, 
Yeah, so hello everyone, this is Hong Ming. So in the first section, I've introduced the connection between common sense and events and existing works that are focusing on collecting the event knowledge. Okay, so I just got started. So common sense is actually crucial for a human to understand uh, their language. For example, when we see a sentence like John stabbed in a puddle and had to go home to change, um, humans should be able to answer why is this happening. For example, to understand this sentence, we need to know the knowledge that stepping in a puddle can cause shoes get wet, which can cause you to feel uncomfortable, which may motivate you to change. So in this section, I will first introduce the connection between the event knowledge and the common sense knowledge. Basically, how can we understand the common sense from the angle of events? And then I will introduce three popular methods we have to use to collect those event knowledge, including the human annotation, automatic IE systems, and the language modeling. And after that, uh, after those instance level event knowledge, I would then talk about how can we go to a more abstract level, basically how can we collect those schema level event knowledge. And in the end, I will conclude by comparing the advantage and disadvantages of all event knowledge acquisition methods. Okay, so common sense. Uh, for ordinary people, common sense basically means the good judgment about the world around us. So, but in the AI community, it is used as a technical term referring to millions of basic facts and understandings processed by most people. So a unique property of common sense is that it is a kind of preference it, and it is not always true. For example, um, if you forget someone's birthday, they may be unhappy with you. But if your friends understand that you are busy these days, they will not be angry. So from this example, we can see that different from factual knowledge, like Obama was the president of the United States, which is always true, the common sense is not. So let's go a little bit deeper and try to think about where could such kind of preference happen? So based on Jake and Dobbs semantic theory, the semantic meaning in our language can be described as a final set of mental primitives and a final set of mental combinations. And actually the prime unit here could include many things. So um, the first kind of unit is the things or entities. For example, cats, we all know what cat is about. Cat is a kind of animal that are typically very cute and have four legs, two eyes, one, uh, one tail, two ears, etc. Besides that, another important prime unit is the state, such as the cat is cute or the cat is smelly. Actually, I think it is fair to say that our understanding about things can be reflected via states because Really, the semantic about things is just a union of all possible states that it could appear in. So basically, the states are describing things. Um, okay, so everything we have been discussing so far are static. However, the world is dynamic and everything is changing. That is why we also need to understand events or more precisely action. Um, so basically, events are describing the changing of states. Here is an example, like the cat is running. Actually, there are many interesting preference or pr interesting common sense knowledge we know about this event. Like we can know why this cat is running in such a hurry. It might be because it just sees some delicious food or it just wakes up and sees some weird guys trying to make a video of it. It just got scared. Um, considering the knowledge about things can be effectively represented by states and events whose overall term is called as eventualities, we can say that the common sense can be reflected with the preference over eventualities. So naturally, the next question would be, how should we represent such preference so that the machines can understand? So to answer this question, we need to think about how this kind of preference is expressed in human language. So based on this uh, lower bound of semantic theory, if we remove grammar from the linguistic description, we will get the semantics. So basically, understanding human language is supposed to speaker's knowledge about this language, like English, Chinese, Germany, and his knowledge about the word, basically the common sense or factual knowledge we care about. Here are some examples. Um, like there are three sentences. Should we take the junior back to the zoo? Should we take the lawn back to the zoo? Should we take the bus back to the zoo? These three sentences share the exactly same uh, grammar structure, but they are describing totally different events, which may have different reasons, effects, or like sub events. Okay, so if we provide a little context here, like it is so dangerous, which one of these three sentences would like to be the next one? I would like to vote for the second one because the line is very dangerous. So I think this comparison is a good example to show that when the grammar is controlled, the selection we made can reflect our understanding about this word. 
So historically, people used to call such grammar-based semantic or preference with the term sexual preference or semantic fit in some other literatures. So basically, sexual preference is a kind of relaxation of the sexual restrictions and is often used as an important kind of syntactic feature. Originally, it was only applied to the is-a hierarchy in wordnet and verb object relations. Um, so the idea of this sexual preference is actually very simple. We control the grammar, like we fix this direct object dependency relation and its head, basically the verbs. Humans should be able to have some preference about the argument it can be connected to. And with this formulation, we can easily use the frequency or some possibility score we assign to these combinations to reflect humans' preference. Here are two examples. The first one is like cat is more likely to be a kind of animal rather than plant. So if a model or a knowledge base can manage to assign hair score to the first combination rather than the second one, we can claim that this model or knowledge base understands humans' preference about this piece of common sense knowledge. Similarly, if a model managed to assign hair score to the first table, eat DOBJ food, rather than the second one, eat DOBJ rock, we can say that, okay, so it knows the common sense that we are more likely to eat food rather than rock. Of course, these two kinds of relations are not enough to cover all the common sense uh, knowledge. People start to extend the definition of sexual preference to other dependency relations like the subject. So for example, it is more likely for a singer or person to sing rather than the house. And then if you further extend the idea of sexual preference to second order, we can find out that, okay, so there are some interesting preference for humans uh, for these verbs to the property of the subject or object. So here is an example. We, we know that hungry is a common property of the subject of it rather than the common property of the object. Okay, so if we further extend, we will get this higher order sexual preference, which describes the common sense knowledge about complex units um, or states. Like eating dinner may cause the person to be full rather than hungry. We call it higher order because really the semantic unit here is the eventualities rather than worse and you need to view each eventuality as a whole. So to summarize what we have discussed so far, the common sense can be expressed by the hair order sexual preference over eventualities. Um, to demonstrate the connection between the preference knowledge about eventualities and the common sense, we can actually try to convert a linguistic-based uh, eventuality KG into human-defined common sense knowledge graphs like ConceptNet. And it turns out that there are many interesting patterns or overlaps between those linguistic relations and the human defined common sense relations. Okay, so assume that we have this linguistic graph which contains an event a customer is food and a state he is full. There is a discourse relation result connecting these two eventualities. And inside these events and states, the words are connected with dependency relations like subject or object. We can find many interesting overlaps between this graph and the common sense assertions in ConceptNet. For example, we can find out that a uh, customer actually appears as a subject and the tail eat food appears as the verb and object uh, for this table of relation. And then we can conclude a pattern that for the table of relation, we can extract the subject as the head and the combination of verb and object as a tail. Similarly, for the, uh, for the receive action relations, we can see that the, the object usually can be found as the head, uh, yeah, sorry, the object usually can be used as the head and the verb as the tail. And last but not least, we can also see some interesting patterns across different events, like this one for the causal relation. Uh, so after we collect those patterns, we can easily apply them back to the original KG to acquire a large scale of common sense knowledge. I won't introduce too much details. I simply borrow some examples and show them here. So the confusing phase means that humans think the extracting knowledge might be problematic. Uh, but I think the overall quality is quite good. Uh, for example, we can actually observe some interesting common sense such as human is capable of having cells and love can cause both being happy and pain from this linguistic graphs. Okay, so after introducing the connection between common sense and the linguistic graphs, um, I will then introduce how do we typically acquire those even knowledge and I will start with the human annotation. So as an important semantic unit, the study on event semantics has long been the focus of the NLP community. Uh, throughout the years, many event-centric resources have been developed, even though they may have different purpose or scales. So for example, FrameNet is considered to be one of the earliest 
knowledge base defining events and their relations. It provides annotation about relations among 1,000 human defined eventuality frames, which contains 27,000 eventualities. However, given the fine green definition of frames, the scale of the annotation is quite limited for each frame. Um, after that, AS reduced the number of event types and annotated more examples for each of the event types. Different from the probank and non-bank views frames over syntactic parse trees and only focus on annotating popular verbs and nouns. Okay, so all aforementioned resources are mostly focusing on the events themselves and do not care too much about the relations between, between them. But there are some resources do care about relations. I think many of them have been mentioned by Qiang. So I just mentioned one, the time bank, uh, which focus as an example, which focus on temporal relation between uh, events. While all previous works are basically annotated by domain experts, they often have very good quality, but they, at the same time, they, of, they also suffer from the scale issue because you know, experts can be very expensive. So recently with the development of uh, cross-sourcing platforms, cross-sourcing actually becomes a more popular way to construct such UNKBs. A more popular one is ConstantNet. Even though the original designing purpose of this common sense of this ConstantNet is a common sense rather than just events, it does contain four event relevant relations like Pre, uh, has prerequisites and has sub event, has first sub event, and has lab sub event. Besides the custom net, several other popular cross sourcing event base are event to man, Propora, and Atomic. They often focus on specific relations between events. For example, Propora focuses on the scientific process, while Atomic focuses on non human defined relation between daily events. And a quick conclusion is that. The most significant advantage of those event-centric knowledge base is that they are often of high quality, but at the same time, it may suffer from the expensive cost and small scale. Also, the limited relation types, because we always need to first define the relations we care about, and then we can annotate them. Okay, so after the human annotation, I would then introduce several work working on uh, how can we automatically construct such event cages? The first work I want to introduce is Nollywood. As one of the earliest large-scale event knowledge graphs, it extracts event knowledge from movie scripts. Specifically, it defines each event to be the combination of verb and its object, and it only focuses on the temporal relation between events. So basically, it uses 560 movie scripts as a corpus, and here is the overall pipeline. It first leverage existing tools like cross parsing and word sense disengagement tools to parse the raw corpus. After that, based on the parsing results, they build a graph inference model to align all the extracted event knowledge. The main purpose of this step is to minimize the influence of the conflict. And in the last step, it build the event taxonomy based on the cleaner knowledge and generate the final KD. So here is, a, here is an example, like showing the extraction results. From this scene, they can actually find some very interesting knowledge about events. Like we often first knock the door and then open up the entrance, and then we can go in, go into the center office. So a big advantage of this approach is the quantity. As this approach is automatic, it is much cheaper than the experts and cross sourcing. It can effectively extract knowledge about uh, 964,000 events which is much larger than ConstantNet. Yeah, here. So besides Nollywood, another large scale event-centric knowledge graph is Acer. Uh, compared with knowledge good, knowledge wood, the overall structure of Acer is more complex. As a result, it has the potential to cover richer event knowledge, but also faces a larger extraction difficulty. Spe uh, specifically, Acer is a hybrid graph, like each node in Acer represents an eventuality, which is in the format of dependency graphs. Uh, currently, Acer uses all the discourse relations between eventualities as the edges. So for the resource, it uses uh, 11 billion token corpus, including Yelp, uh, New York Times, uh, Wikipedia, Reddit, subtitles, and eBooks. So here is the overall extraction pipeline. After collecting the raw corp corpus, Acer first pre processes the text with dependency parser, and then perform the eventuality extraction algorithm with a Python-based mining uh, algorithm. And after that, Acer will extract discourse relations from those candidate instances with the help of an explicit discourse parser. Considering that 
compared with the eventualities, the discourse parkers are much more sparse. Uh, they also introduced an additional bootstrapping framework to improve the overall density. So as a result, uh, they created Acer. As you can see from this example, it is essentially a hybrid graph. Like each node in Acer is a hyper edge of words that describes an eventuality, basically a state or an event. Um, and there exist the heterogeneous edges among the eventualities, the discourse relations. So current Acer contains 194 million eventualities and 64 million edges. Uh, actually, lots of interesting common sense can be found in this example. For example, the eventuality I eat food appears more than 3,000 times in the whole KG, uh, but the eventuality I eat rock never appears. So by comparing these two, we can actually see that the statistics about eventualities actually reflect lower order sexual preference we mentioned before. Uh, we can also observe some interesting higher order SV, such as we often make a call before we go and being tired and being hangry often happen together. As for the quantity and the quality of eventuality extraction, the overall precision is about 80%, uh, which is quite good, especially considering that there is no annotation. And an important reason for this is the, they designed the eventuality extraction algorithm to be very strict. So they kind of sacrifice the recall for the precision. As for the scale, of course, scale is often an important issue here, but since the approach is uh, automatic and they can easily increase the scale by scanning more data. So for example, after extracting eventuality from uh, 11 billion token corpus, they extract actually 1 million to 100 million unique eventualities for each of the patterns. As for the edges, it got 64 million edges in total. And uh, here are the distribution and qualities. As you can see from this result, in general, the distribution is not very balanced. Uh, some of the relation appear over 8 million times, while some of them appear less than 6,000 times. And as for the quality, it is a little bit worse than you try this because the hair order SP can be more complex. Okay, so here is a set comparison of all the aforementioned word-based knowledge bases. Currently, Acer is the largest one. It is uh, 100 times larger than Nollywood and 1,000 times larger than Consumnet. Okay, so in the last part of the instance level event knowledge acquisition, I would then introduce several works focusing on the language modeling. So recently, the most important breakthrough in the LP community is really the pre-trained language models. Uh, with the help of deep models and the large scale pre-training corpus, the language model managed to memorize rich knowledge and common sense knowledge is not, or even knowledge is not an exception here. So basically one natural question is that how can we mine such knowledge out of these language models? And to answer this question, Comet proposed a super solution by learning with a seed common sense or even knowledge graph like Atomic, it managed to produce interesting knowledge with the help of these pre-trained uh, models. Here is the overall framework. Like even though the approach is very straightforward, it first encodes the head and the relation with an encoder and then try to predict the tail, the tail event with a standard decoder, the overall result is quite impressive. Besides extracting event knowledge from the language models, as those language models may also not be perfect, people also care about how can we help them to better I mean, model those uh, event knowledge or even common sense. And Taco LM is a good example here. Specifically, it aims at helping language models to understand how long does an event typically last for. Some examples are like uh, moving chairs will typically last for seconds, but moving piano will last for hours because piano is much heavier. And similarly, moving to a different city may take years. So with the goal of building a general time aware language model with minimum separation, Taco LM starts with uh, focused and supervised information extraction step in which they use a set of high precision patterns to acquire those temporal information. This helps the model to overcome, I mean, the reporting bias as we can automatically extract over uh, large scale uh, natural, language, natural text. And after that, uh, after that, they use the temporal information they acquired in step one to jointly train the language model. Specifically, they pre-train the language model jointly over uh, multiple temporal dimensions, such as it is able to, such that it, it is able to utilize the natural relations such as duration being inversely related to frequency. This is actually quite beneficial because sometimes we may not be able to, I mean, see or found some direct mention of the duration of brushing teeth. 
However, we know that if it's shortened that morning as the frequency is likely to be every morning. And this actually provides further generalization to combine the reporting bias. And finally, they can combine the, lang uh, the final language model, Taco LM, a bird transformer that is more aware of time. So here are more technical details. So in the information extract type, extraction step, a set of high precision Python based uh, patterns based on SL parsing results are used to mine those temporal information in duration, frequency, and technical time. So considering that we have this uh, raw sentence, I played basketball uh, for two hours, after parsing it with the SRL, we can actually see, we can actually get the arc zero, arc one verbs, as well as the temporal argument. So here, the most important thing is this uh, uh, temporal argument for two hours, which can actually match the duration pattern. That is, we know that two hours is de describing the duration of this verb uh, played. So following this, we can then transform this original sentence into a training instance of a event, dimension of value and tuples. Um, and in, in total, we got 4.3 million such tuples for pre-training. And for the model part, um, they employ a simple objective of masking some tokens in the aforementioned sequence and then recover them such that the model can know more about that. With the high pro higher probability, they will mask a temporal value while keeping all others. Otherwise, they will keep they will instead mask some event tokens and keep the temporal value token unchanged. In this case, they can maximize the conditional probability of the event and the value at the same time to preserve the original capability of a language model. Okay, so after introducing the common way of collecting instance level of event knowledge, I would then introduce a recent work that focused on schema, schema level UN knowledge. So the good thing about schema level UN knowledge is that it can actually help us to achieve a kind of abstraction to transfer the knowledge from the observed events, uh, the observed event instances to unseen ones. At the same time, it can also help the, to us to select the salient UN knowledge and minimize the influence of noise. Here is an example. Assume that we have, um, we have two instance level UN graph, even though they are not describing the identical event, uh, some components are shared. So for example, how are these transport events are connected with the attack events? And to effectively find such schema knowledge, they first pro uh, generate a set of passes and then learn a pass language model. As a result, um, they will get the final gram, uh, graph schema. So here is how they train the language, uh, the past language model. The approach is uh, straightforward. You can concatenate multiple parts together and treat it as a sentence to, to feed into the models such that, such that the model can know the coherence of those passes. And the one thing worth mentioning is that to capture the coherence information of two passes, they also introduce an additional neighbor pass classification loss. And after we get those, um, schema graphs, we can then apply them back to recover the instance graphs. For example, if you only see an incomplete instance graph G, you can actually leverage the schema graph as we got here to predict some of the missing nodes in this uh, incomplete graph G. Another application of the schema is that we can use it to help improve the aforementioned uh, event extraction systems. For example, if you already extract an event and we know that it belongs to a schema, we can pay more attention to the other events in that schema. So it's kind of like we already know what we are trying to look for here. And as for the results, uh, the schema knowledge can actually help further improve the performance of the state-of-the-art IE system. Okay, so this is the conclusion of the fourth section. Uh, so in the first part of my talk, I demonstrate that there is a transferability from UN knowledge to common sense knowledge. And after that, I introduce those popular existing uh, even knowledge acquisition approaches uh, to show that, I mean, compared with common sense, acquiring those even knowledge is often cheaper and more scalable. And uh, last but not least, there is no perfect acquisition systems and we need to select the most suitable one based on our need. So yeah, there are many pros and cons for different approaches you can refer to this table. So basically that is all for the first section. Uh, oh, right, so here is all the key references. And but if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask.
Yeah, thanks, homie, for this uh, very thorough talk. Uh, actually, why not I, I, I start with one of my questions. So I kind sure. of understand that uh, knowledge acquisition, there's potentially one main difference from this and uh, lots of other IE problem is because, uh, especially about common sense knowledge. Common sense knowledge is something like uh, people know by default. So it is likely that when you compose something in documents, you may not mention something you know by default. Then in that case, why you induce this kind of common sense knowledge, regardless of whether that's about event or not, is there a way to, let's say, filter noise or decide what kind of knowledge is more confident than, what kind of fact is more confident than others? Uh, what do you mean by confident? Okay, let's say confident or salient or, you know, something oh. are more trustworthy. Um, yeah, so that's a very interesting question. Like, I mean, uh, many people consider common sense to be not mentioned in our daily conversations, yep. right? But uh, the assumption we make here is that it has to be somewhere. Otherwise, you haven't, I mean, for human, that's a different story. I mean, we are just talking for machine first. So for mm -hmm. machines, if you want to got this knowledge, it has to be appear in some of the documents in the universe, right? You have to see, maybe it only appears once, but if you can capture it from that, then somehow you can use it to uh, kind of referring the new coming common sense reasoning problems. But one critical issue here is the reporting bias, which is quite critical for all the common sense knowledge acquisition approaches. The reporting bias basically means that those events or those knowledge, even though they appear much less time than others, that does not really mean that they are not important. Um, yeah. yeah. That's indeed actually, that's there, right. Yeah, but there is actually a study on how severe this kind of reporting bias is. So the experiment shows that about 78 of the times, uh, there is a positive correlation between the frequency of uh, those knowledge that appear, I mean, the, their frequency, their natural frequency and the human annotation. So we can see that the reporting bias is actually, it is important, but uh, that shouldn't stop us to collect knowledge from the documents. And another way to minimize the, info, uh, the influence of this reporting bias, I think it is covered by Taco LM. It actually used some human knowledge to design some patterns mm -hmm. to extract the specific knowledge you care about. That can actually help you to minimize the influence of those reporting bias, I guess. Yeah, I, I think particularly because, you know, common sense knowledge facts are usually less uh, mentioned in uh, generally in corpus. So this is actually why acquiring this kind of uh, knowledge using a specific yeah. knowledge engineering process is kind of more meaningful, even though nowadays you have language models that read through lots of yeah. corpus. You are, you are uh, uh, essentially, yeah. you, are, you are get lots of facts, but you are miss lots of common sense facts. Yeah, actually, I think that makes sense for like why multi-model even extraction is very important because a lot of common sense is actually by covered by videos, and yeah, that also helps answer the question, I guess. Okay, thanks and nice talk. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, so let's move on to Han and uh, Dan again for the vision and the future work. Hi, I'm uh, I was away for a few seconds. Um, yeah. It's my turn, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can start sharing screen. Yeah, yeah. sorry, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm very happy to see some friends in the audience. So I hope, really hope we can get some live questions. Uh, you know, we worked very hard to prepare this tutorial and just to have, want to have some discussions with others you know, outside of our team. So uh, at this, toward the end, um, Dan and I will be talking about some challenges, applications, and maybe kind of lay out what we should do next, uh, some roadmap. But uh, we, of course, we would like to hear feedback from the audience, you know, whether you think this makes sense or anything else we should be focusing on. Um, yeah, so there are students and, um, um, 
and other uh, former students, they have presented the, the wonderful uh, overview about what we have been doing and other people have been doing in this field, all the technical details. So we can already observe a lot of successes, in, uh, especially in the past uh, maybe five or six years because of the successful combination of deep neural network and also some uh, smart way of discovering symbolic knowledge. So uh, we would like to show a few um, really good successful stories first. So um, at the beginning, Dan talked about this uh, basic idea of writing history book. So we would like to have a system that can help historians and librarians to construct a history book. And the motivation is very clear because human written ones are not very complete and sometimes they're highly biased. And now because we have all kinds of multimodal, multilingual uh, information coming from diverse, uh, very wide range of data, maybe it's time to uh, really take advantage of uh, all these techniques we have and then uh, uh, create this kind of assistant. And this is also very important to be able to um, uh, clean up what we know or what we don't know about the, uh, the some facts and how the events connect to each other. So here shows you an example about this uh, fake news about, you know, um, Bill Gates was the founder of this coronavirus just because he gave a great talk uh, six years ago. And uh, this picture is actually a fake one. Um, this, this is from another meeting. So they intentionally put uh, Bill Clinton behind him and just to uh, check some critical reaction and also because he donated a lot of money. So all this kind of evidence put together, people tend to, some people, a few people tend to believe this is the true information. So we often are shocked by how humans tend to believe this kind of fake information. The reason is because people are really good at connecting dots. So that's not how we do event suggestion nowadays because usually we just uh, look at each sentence one by one, do sequence decoding. Sometimes we could go beyond sentence to uh, cross document the co-reference solution. And uh, you have already seen the event event relations and we incorporate global knowledge. So I think we are uh, making good progress toward this goal. So, um, so uh, what we would like to do is to construct some chapters for any major events. And they will look like Wikipedia page, but also we want to organize them so that you can see how the different pages are connected to each other through event event relations. And each event, major event, will have the hierarchy and will have their own properties. And we'll also show what are the major characters. And then uh, we also should update this over time and for human to do curation. Um, so in one example, it will look like a news timeline. So this is the 2019 Hong Kong protest, human written news timeline. So you can see each um, chapter will have a title that will talk about a super event. And then in, inside this chapter, you will see the timeline. You will see a major event that happened in the temporal order. And it's presented in a multi-model way. And we can also organize some certain events in hierarchy. For example, this is all the sub-events under this uh, super event ISIS activities. And you can also see how they are connected to each other through causal and temporal relations. And why this is useful. So we can, once we have this uh, organized uh, summaries and chapters about these major events, and then we can recommend events to users based on their structured input. For example, if they, want to know anything uh, related to protest about uh, human rights and then in you know, some certain location, certain time frame, then this system can recommend much more relevant information and also show them how these different events are connected to each other in a multi-model fashion. And then we can also provide much more accurate answers for question answering. For example, here we show you some multiple questions like uh, we, will primary schools in Europe admit non-vaccinated children around September 2019? So you can see there are two events here, admission and uh, vaccination. And uh, they have constrained into a frame. We also, uh, what kind of uh, arguments are being mentioned. So then if we can just search the, uh, comprehensive event knowledge base we constructed, we will be able to go across documents, across sources and provide accurate answer. And similarly, we can use this kind of system as part of dialogue and we can then 
uh, let the user talk about the whole uh, story, and then we can give a more accurate answer. For example, their left side, we show example, this person is talking about what happened during the load trip, and uh, then we can uh, provide some suggestions or maybe you know, clarify the situation in a very effective way. So um, in our current uh, projects, we have applied this to uh, self-load domains. So one of the most suc successful domains that Dan and I uh, led uh, for uh, six years so far is uh, about disaster relief. So we applied our techniques to multilingual. Uh, so actually uh, we applied this to 300 languages and we gather together all these um, natural disaster events and show them a heat map. So as an English speaker, you don't need to really go back to read, or uh, you won't be able to read all those 300 languages, but from the map, you can see what's going on and you can see uh, which location needs more water or needs evacuation. And if you don't trust the information, we still show the evidence sentence and the translations. So this can help us to do better resource allocation. And we also apply this uh, for some intelligence analysis domains for example, uh, MH17 crash, and uh, we can show the different uh, subgraphs, which clearly are conflicting to each other. So each subgraph, we can consider this as a one hypothesis. And then the analysts can contribute to their own domain knowledge. For example, they can say, oh, I noticed this missile uh, is owned by Russia so that we can remove uh, this uh, purple hypothesis because it's uh, conflicting with uh, what we discovered from the uh, multimedia multilingual source. Um, and then we can also associate this with some implicit attributes. For example, here we again show even a heat map, but also at the same time, we are showing the human moral value we detected from social media. And then for this, we will be able to explain what's happening and uh, uh, also predict the event intent and so on. Uh, and then we recently, we also applied this to scientific domain uh, for the events, uh, biological events, uh, from biomedical papers and click notes, really, especially related to COVID-19. So um, compared to general news domain, uh, scientific papers have many unique challenges. Number one, many concepts are not explained, not like you know you normally see entity in the news, you will see the title and affiliation, but then many concepts are not explained because uh, papers are written for experts. So we need to borrow external knowledge. So we did anti-linking and we use uh, enriched representation from the linked results, the definition of the concept, the hierarchical uh, properties, and also some uh, uh, relation, anti-anti uh, -anti relations in the external knowledge base. So use that to enrich our representation. And also in many of the scientific papers, it's really important to enrich the concept representation using their uh, images and sub-figures. Um, so we use a multimodal representation similar to what we showed in the cross media uh, transfer uh, that Manley was talking about. And then we use a similar framework to extract the entities relations and events and also the event event relations. And then we can present the multimedia knowledge base. And this will help uh, the users to be able to browse millions of papers in a structural way. And then they can see the summaries, they can see how the uh, different entities connect to each other. So this is a typical framework. As you can see, this looks very similar to what Manny has already presented. The only difference is in the input representation is much richer than what we normally do in the news domain. And uh, similarly, this is a multi-model representation. So the only difference is we are not doing situation recognition, but rather we are doing some uh, domain-specific uh, graph parsing for these molecular structures. And we also look at the sub-figures so that we can have a multi-model representation. Um, so then the final knowledge graph is not just a text based, but it's multimodal. You can see all these uh, are grounded into the corresponding structures from the uh, papers. And uh, for example, if we are showing this results for uh, drug per person report about individual data, in addition to the text evidence, we also show the corresponding subfigure that actually uh, associated with some certain hypothesis in the knowledge graph. Um, so this is another example in a typical uh, drug repurposing report. You need to show the side effect of this uh, potential drug. And uh, normally, um, 
we don't see that evidence exactly, you know, written in any sentence or any particular paper because many of these drugs did not go through clinical trials. But if we look into the external database, which are already linked to our events we discovered from the papers, we can see which other diseases will share similar symptoms. And then if we can show this subgraph to the user, they can then uh, make their assessment, you know, how many papers are showing this evidence. And then if they don't trust the results, they can still go back to check the evidence sentences. All right, so that's about the application side. But of course, we are not doing enough. We, there are many, you know, the many challenges. Number one, uh, I think we should uh, borrow some ideas from computer vision community. Uh, in that community, they often take advantage of the global scene understanding. So for example, if we know the video is talking about ISIS attack, then you will not identify this picture as a bombing, or you will not identify this as a concert, even though it looks like concert. So you to uh, make the model toward uh, predicting this is a bombing. So in NLP, because we have this powerful localized uh, uh, embedding methods and uh, we have very nice framework like sequence to sequence, so people kind of forget about the global knowledge. So I think the one general message we conveyed in this tutorial is that we should discover those global knowledge in advance or in online fashion. And then we do more top-down work and combine with uh, our bottom-up uh, sequence decoding. And uh, similarly, uh, that can help us to uh, be able to design guild and discover some long tail triggers and arguments. So for example, here, the phrase was let go means uh, someone was uh, quitting from a job, but it's a very uncommon uh, phrase. So if we can have the whole scenario understanding, then we should be able to infer this as a end position event. And then we can also do a much better disambiguation. For example, here says he slapped a lot on the table. So if you have no idea about left a lot on the table means someone will put uh, the mini food there. That is very hard for the model to be able to um, uh, not tag this as transportation because left usually means the transportation. Um, and uh, in terms of event collaborations, event event relations, we are still having hard time to distinguish the sub-event super event relation from event co-reference. So what we mean by co-reference usually is exact co-reference, but uh, we often see some partial co-reference. For example, the first example shows the super event uh, is a fire and the shooting is the sub-event. And also there are some sub-events that are connected in a timeline. They belong to the same super event and our model often mistakenly tag them as a co-reference. For the multimodal side, um, it's easy to blame others. So we really think that <laughs> not just us, the computer vision uh, community needs to spend more time and efforts on detecting the basic building blocks. For example, um, they really have had time to tag this as a people just because uh, you know the, the box is too vague and too small and there are too many people there. So it's hard to define and we should put this this box as, uh, as people or this whole box as people, because if you put the whole box as people, you will include this on street. So it's, it's not as clear as what we normally see in text. We have a trigger and we have the arguments, you know, indicated by phrases. In, in images, it's very difficult uh, to define them and to uh, identify them in open domain fashion. Uh, similarly, here shows that uh, the attention heat map really have real trouble to identify which part of this image are protesters because there are many too many instances. Um, and in terms of knowledge acquisition, we talked a lot about how can we discover this from natural language text, but we also have this uh, gigantic uh, semi-structured databases like Wikidata, Wikipedia, Google Ngrams, Yago. So we should try to take advantage of the layout uh, take advantage of the uh, info boxes, the properties, and then uh, discover some patterns. So for example, we can uh, find the temporal relation, spatial relation, and from Google Ngrams, we can discover some properties, for example, the duration of these events. Um, we can also look into, for example, Wikipedia page view, so that if two events always get a co-burst, then that means some implicit association connection between them. All right. so. Um, how to combine this kind of knowledge, right? Because the trend is really like, we don't need this knowledge. We, we just do embedding and the language model is 
know enough what to do anything. But so, so all the fashion people, so four of us, uh, we gathered together uh, two years ago in Dexto in this castle, and we were talking about this. How can we uh, incorporate symbolic knowledge? So Ido, uh, then uh, Yob, and, and myself. So we come up with this uh, different ways of combining symbolic and structure knowledge into embedding distributional knowledge, and then we can do better event understanding. Um, so the motivation is really like, we still notice there's some advantages with sem sem uh, symbolic semantics. For example, they are easier to manipulate. And if you have some prior knowledge, you should be able to order them in a nice fashion and they're much more explainable. Of course, uh, distribution semantics should still keep in, um, embrace them because they are much more ex uh, scalable to multimedia and multilingual. And you can use that for cross-lingual, cross-media transfer as you have seen from uh, Manning's presentation. And uh, they generally give us a continuous representation so you can make your soft decision. Your matching can be also soft matching and you don't have those hard constraints anymore. So it's much more generalizable. So we come up with five different ways to combine. Uh, the first one is really you should try to manipulate data uh, when you do the embedding learning. So for example, entities are very special. So many should have some examples about uh, why phrase embedding will fail at representing entities. So if we can replace those mentions with the entity IDs in the input data to learn the representation, then you should be able to combine the entity labels together with the um, with uh, embedding, wood embedding in a nice way. Similarly, if the input is a figure or image or table, then you should have some structural way to capture the position and the interdependency. And so that's basically how you can, you know, improve the representation using the better uh, input data. And then uh, we can use graph neural network to initialize the embedding, and then we can borrow the uh, AMR parsing as we have seen from the first and second sessions, and then we can propagate uh, the representation. So you have the semantic parser uh, that was trained from symbolic knowledge and then use that to propagate the embedding representation. And then we can also uh, uh, continue our efforts, you know, discover their common sense knowledge, discover schemas, and use that to as a global constraints and improve our decoding. So when you have multiple hypotheses, you kind of use the global knowledge to rank them. And then finally, we can also just use that as a post-processing, symbolic knowledge as post-processing to name what we discovered in terms of new event types, new argument roles, a new schema, and we can then uh, use that for reasoning. And uh, the other direction we would like to advocate is a document level event injection because we think that we already have done enough on sentence level, and a lot of arguments are really located in other sentences. So there, recently there are many efforts, as we have seen from Manny's talk, uh, about doing this on document level. So I think this is a new direction that everyone should have put more efforts on. And uh, then we can explore, um, collaborate with other communities. For example, we can apply this for fact checking because most of the fake news discussion is applied on document level, not on knowledge element level. But once we have this uh, cross source, multimedia, multilingual event knowledge base, we should be able to provide evidence, make the fact checking more explainable. And then we can combine that with the source evidence and the provenance. Yeah, so that's all. And uh, I think Dan will have uh, a few slides talk about grand vision, like um, his opinion about what we should do next. Uh, thanks a lot, Hank. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to finish with uh, a few more uh, vision slides or, or uh, if you want, PhD thesis planning. Uh, so uh, hopefully all those that survive these this three hours are interested in events and, and realize that it's a challenge. So I want to give uh, a concrete challenges at, at several levels of abstraction. And I'm going to start uh, with, with a few uh, rather detailed low-level event-centric challenges. So let me start with time. So, so it's clear, and hopefully what we've presented so far um, clarifies even better that uh, represented time uh, is crucial if you want to understand uh, and reason about events. But a lot of aspects of that uh, are still open problems. Uh, and these have to do, for example, with thinking about 
the level of expressivity that natural language has relative to the type of formulation that we have today to represent time. So if you just look uh, at the two uh, sentences that I point to with the arrows, one of them says that the lion had a large meal and slept for 24 hours. What do we really mean? Uh, when did it eat? Was it exactly 24 hours? Uh, and the second one talks about the lion typically sleeps for 24 hours after having large meals. And, and the question is, how do we represent it and what kind of conclusions can we draw from this? So um, really the, the formulations that we have today are often not good enough to support the type of reasoning that we, we wanna, uh, that we wanna perform. Uh, quite often when we qualify an event with some temporal argument, we don't have the expressivity to think about what does it really mean? If you think about these three events, uh, all of them mention 1944. In 1944, US and Germany were at war. John got married in 1944. Jim was born in 1944. Today, we're gonna express this as an interval that starts at the beginning, January 1st, 1944, and ends at the last day, but really they mean different things, right? So, so US and Germany were at war throughout 1944. John got married at some point in 1944 and hopefully got married throughout the rest of, stayed married throughout the rest of the year. John was born in one moment or one day in 1944. So these are really different uh, events from a temporal perspective. Uh, moreover, temporal relations or temporal information often conveys uh, a lot of information that goes beyond the time. So if you look at these two examples, I can start with the second one. World War I started before FDR took office. And that's basically just uh, a fact. Uh, and they tell us you know, something about the order of these events. If you read the first one, the Great Depression started before FDR took office. This actually carries a lot more meaning because in fact, it started before, but FDR took office just a couple of years after it started. And this sentence is meant to say, while he is not to blame for the Great Depression, it's his responsibility uh, to get us out of it. So, so really the temporal information conveys a lot more than just time. Um, and of course, there's additional issues with um, how we express time, how we nest time, how we think about negations or uncertainty. So you can look at these three um, uh, snippets where they convey about the same level of information, but with very different emphasis in, and in very different ways. And they actually send different messages. So again, there is a big gap between the level of expressivity that we have in natural language and, the, um, and, and that we hope to be able to use when we reason about events and what our formulations and our technical capabilities support today a lot of very interesting issues that we can deal with. The second aspect I wanna address have to do with, uh, with reasoning about events and its relation to planning and common sense. So quite often, uh, if we wanna reason about event, it requires that we think about planning and this planning often requires understanding implicit event uh, reason and reasoning about both time and quantities in general. Here's a question. Will we make it to dinner before the movie? And, and think about the type of uh, issues that you have to address in order to, to answer this question. So you have to know what the time is now. You have to know when is the movie, that's easy. Perhaps you, can, you need to infer how long it takes to drive to the movie. That's also quite easy today. But how long does dinner take? It probably depends on the type of dinner. Moreover, it depends on where we're gonna go for dinner. Uh, there are other implicit events. Maybe we need to uh, look for parking in the dinner place. Maybe we need to look for parking next to the movie. You realize that this is a pre-COVID uh, question. Now we don't have to ask these questions anymore. Uh, but you can see that this question involves uh, planning involves uh, understanding time, multiple aspects of times, from absolute time to duration of events, and 
understanding implicit events and, and the need to put things together. Still, we don't know how to do this. Uh, this guy, you probably know who this guy is. If you don't, uh, it's Aristotle. And we can ask a question like, uh, did Aristotle have a laptop? While it's not completely explicit in the question, uh, this is a question about time. And, and you all take about a second to understand that this is in fact a funny question because of course it didn't. And you know why, you know what events are involved and you know that you need to know the order of the events. By the way, if you Google this, you will see that he did have a laptop because there's a book titled Aristotle's Laptop. So Google correctly infers that he did have a laptop. Uh, so again, this is something that requires us to do reasoning, to decompose uh, questions that are uh, based on just implicit information. Um, and uh, here is my final example here, where again, we want to think about events. In this case, it's an election related event. There are funding issues. And in order to understand this, we have to understand quantities and we have to be able to reason about quantities. So again, just uh, event extraction is not sufficient for us. We have to involve almost everything that uh, uh, we know about natural language understanding if we want to think about it. Uh, I think this is my final example for the detailed example, and this has to do with grounding. So uh, there is a need to ground in order to reason about events. And the level of grounding we are doing today, basically entity linking, if you want, isn't sufficient. We have to think about temporal grounding and spatial ground. For example, you can ask, where is this event that you describe you? So assuming that you uh, identify the person in the picture, do you identify the location? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Similarly, uh, here is uh, an event. In order to really understand what's happening here, we need to understand a lot of things outside the sentence. We need to understand what is this event, where and when did it happen, and this will potentially give us some background information to understand the event. And similarly, uh, if I wanna know when the visit to Berlin took place, I need to understand an event like the collapse of the wall. That is a well-defined event, uh, but again, I have to address the grounding question in order to, to deal with it. Okay, so, uh, to complete this, I want to challenge you with another big set of questions. Uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, examples at this point uh, is to think about long pieces of text. Let's think about books. So the example I give here is that of Charles Dickens, David Copperfield. Hopefully many of you read it or at least know what it is about. And books are about events. Uh, and um, what's interesting about books is that specifically in this kind of historical uh, fiction, it talks about a lot of events. Specifically here, we learn to know David Copperfield from the time he was born throughout his life, people that he knew, people that he fell in love and out of love uh, with, events that happened to him all the way until he, uh, got married, became old, uh, and uh, this, this is all fiction. And you know it, as a reader, it's very easy to understand uh, this. At the same time, these events are happening in London, in England in the 19th century, and the background uh, provides a lot of information about the socioeconomic state in England in the 19th century, about child exploitation, school, prisons, the immigration to Australia. These are true historical facts. And as human readers, we have very little difficulties to understand what has happened, to distinguish fact from fiction, from fiction and, and really um, understand what is happening here. So um, we are far uh, from being able to uh, even formulate well the computational tasks that we should think about. 
And finally, I want to challenge you, challenge you with the following uh, scenario, which I call event reconstruction. So my example here is one frame from a video that the New York Times put together uh, just published a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a, a reconstruction video of the killing of uh, Breonna Taylor. Uh, quite an amazing video. I recommend everyone to follow this link and look at it. It's, it's quite short. How did they do it? I mean, this is manual labor that took weeks. Uh, and it was done by analyzing written evidence, transcript from interviews with witnesses, policemen, neighbors, analysis of physical evidence collected in the scene, um, and, and really literally took weeks to produce. Can this be automated uh, to form a reconstruction of a chain of events, or at least partly automated so that we can help uh, people that do this? Uh, ideally, if we are able to develop a tool that helps analysts in this case, of course, it requires multimodal capabilities. It requires understanding events described in text, uh, reasoning about quantities and geometry, reasoning about uncertainty, uh, reasoning, and that's really important, and we're not doing enough of it, about possible conflicting events and reporting about events. So we need to uh, develop the notion of multiple perspectives and trustworthiness um, in order to uh, provide a hypothesis to human analysts and so on. So again, I think this is kind of, you can think about it as one of the grand goals uh, of, of, this, uh, of this line of work. And as I said, it's not only natural language processing, of course, it's a multimodal uh, task. Uh, with that, I want to thank you uh, in the name of all our six presenters. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this, and I'm hoping that you can stay and ask questions.